Congratulations. Hi, everybody. I'm Suyari from Japan. Congratulations, graduations. Uh, I'm happy to hear about that you will join our industry. You all are hope for game industry. Please keep your passion, your dreams, till dreams come true. Congratulations again. Uh, we, uh, hello everyone. I'm Matt Parker, another member of the NYU Game Center faculty. We are now entering the second half of our show when we switch to our MFA thesis games. Uh, but before we do, I want to give, uh, just another shout out to all the BFAs who presented in the first half, as well as the faculty and staff to help coordinate all that went into the BFA presentations. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Robert Yang for running all the tech for the BFA portion. Uh, it was a monumental task and uh, Robert crushed it. Uh, so now we're going to switch to our MSA, MFA thesis section of the show where we show the final projects of our master's students uh, who worked in our two-year master's program. Uh, I'm going to be joined by Greg Heffernan. Uh, so can we bring Greg in right now, uh, aka Cosmo D. Uh, who teaches at the NYU Game Center uh, as an alumni of our uh, incubator program, also the creator of the hit indie games Off Peak, the Norwood Suite, and just released uh, Tales from Off Peak City on Steam uh, like a week ago, right, uh, Greg? Last Friday. Last Friday, less than a week ago, hot off the presses. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Uh, so welcome, Greg, are you excited? Very excited. I am yeah, also Let's do this. I love your background. It's very, very Pippin. <laughs> Thank Find you. Your corner of the sky. It's so appropriate for a great Very, I wanted to be on theme. Yeah, for this. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, so we're going to bring in our first game now, Laudel Knot. Ooh. All right, we are now joined by Ricardo Escobar and Jin Sung. Uh, I want you guys to tell us about your game, Laudel Knot. Yeah, so uh, Laudel Knot is an underwater pet sim set on an ocean planet that is recovering from an ecological disaster. Let's check out the trailer.
Wow. Working that, hard a lot oh on my that. Goodness. Yeah. yeah. Ah, uh, it, this game is so adorable. First of all, I just got to say uh, the art, uh, the, the music in the game, uh, the little creatures, how everything moves. I, I, I want to also call out, though, that the, the game feel of this game really matches this aesthetic. You know, when you play this game, you really feel uh, like you're controlling this cute little uh, underwater guy who's uh, feeding uh, these sweet little animals. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you made it match up so well that it just feels so cohesive, the, the game feel and the visuals and the sounds, how it all fits together so well? Yeah, so uh, even though our game is sort of uh, low risk, we wanted to focus on game feel from like the outset, uh, because if it's more about uh, relaxation and s the satisfying process of cleaning stuff up, we want that to feel as satisfying as possible. Um, so our very first prototypes for our thesis were more game feel prototypes that uh, focused on you know, making sure the timing of picking up every object was just right and making sure uh, the laser felt, you know, finely tuned. So uh, that's been sort of a driving force behind our design. I agree that, you know, you're doing these chores, you're, you're cleaning stuff up. If it doesn't feel satisfying and kinetic and pleasing in that way, um, it's the, that's like the fundamentals. So I think it's great that yeah. you've got that, you know, right from the beginning. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you call them chores because if, if you didn't design it to be that pleasurable, it would feel like a chore. But having played yep. this game, I can say that it really does feel so satisfying uh, when you're. It's a ritual. It. It's yeah. a it's a cleaning ritual. Yeah, it is really nice. Um, I think you know one of the things that we sort of see a theme throughout a lot of these games coming out of this class is that we have this sort of you're alone isolated, if you will, under the water, but you're still trying to improve the world. Was that part of your mission, part of your goal? Is there a larger environmental message that you wanted to get across? Uh, yeah, so the environmental part of our game came originally from a desire to just make a pet sim where you eventually have to let go of your pets. So you, you have to raise these cute little creatures, but eventually you have to release them into the wild. Uh, so we needed a reason for why they couldn't survive on their own without your help. Uh, and given the sort of ocean setting of our game, and I guess the state of our own oceans here on Earth, uh, it made sense to have, have everything be polluted and make it more of a game about ocean cleanup and ocean conservation. So uh, you, you have a big announcement, right? Uh, you have, uh, you, do you want to say it or do you want me to say it? Uh, you can say it, and then we'll. Uh, so you were awarded the Alfred P. Sloan Award, uh, nice. the Game Design Award. So that's twenty thousand dollars to continue the development of the game uh, about games of real science content. Mm. What are your plans for the future with this? What are you gonna? What's next for Lotto Knot? Yeah. So uh, the funding from the Sloan Foundation will allow us to continue working on it full time, which means uh, more cool underwater biomes to explore and more types of lotls that evolve to different biomes uh, as you clean them up and reintroduce them back to the wild. Final question, what is a lotl? A lotl uh, is an alien creature that is inspired by axolotls. That's where <laughs> they get their name. So they, they grow is it and evolve. Axolotl? Is it axolotl? Have I been saying it wrong? Axolotl or axolotl? Both ways. Yeah, both ways. <laughs> okay. yeah. Um, but yeah, we're all inspired by how axolotls kind of regenerate and evolve so uh yeah that's what a lot of us oh, well, thank you so much yeah. uh yeah this is really uh, a great game and i'm really looking forward to, to seeing the future thing. congratulations thank you. thank you thanks so uh next we're gonna yeah. uh so next we're gonna bring in our next game ilia oh yes
we are now joined by Chen Wei Jin and Lu Jing Zhang, and they are going to tell us about their game, Ilea. Hey. <laughs> um. <laughs> Eventually, just one <laughs> sentence uh, description of the game. Yeah, uh, I think we can play the trailer first. And okay, let's play the trailer. Okay. Here we go. So yeah, we're gonna, we are having a little bit of technical issues, but uh, we will we'll get them sorted shortly. We are back and we are now going to check out the trailer. Cool. Really impressive. Yeah, that is a, a very cool looking game with a very interesting and unique mechanic. And so I imagine one of the challenges in a game like this is how do you make that challenge, how do you make that mechanic clear uh, to the players? And what, what were the sort of design iterations you, you went through to, to teach people how to play this game? Hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, I think the, I, I think just, just make it through a very short uh, tutorial that yeah, the first three level is a tutorial. And the first level, you only move the mirror front and back, and you see the behavior of the uh, the behavior of the refraction. Yeah. And then the next you move the next level is that you move the mirror left and right, and then you, you see the behavior. And the last is moving up and down. And through these three basic levels, and I think most of the people get how the mechanism works. And then later on they will try on some more cheaper things like move it yeah uh like moving it uh, you can also move it left and right or front and back and many other tricks that can play through this mechanism so i think tutorial is the yeah tutorial is the key did you get this idea before even you know touching a, a new unity project or did this grow out of your your work in using using the software like was this concept first or, or were you did this emerge from you messing around i'm curious mm, maybe not the, actually yeah. say that i again. think it's the the mechanic first so rooney did this uh game for matt uh matt's class for Colette guilty, guilty. yeah so like <laughs> i i think he, yeah rooney you want to talk about it so Mm, yeah, uh, actually, I didn't play it in real life before I had this idea. I just, firstly, I make a mirror in a class called Visual System. And then in Max class, when I'm going to do the final work, I do not know what to do. And I, I remember, oh, I have a mirror in other class. So let me bring the mirror <laughs> in and do a mechanism on it. And to finish this 
finish his assignment. Uh, and yeah, and I start to try to think of uh, a, a, a mechanism based on the mirror and uh -huh. I and it's a flash of light that, oh, if you can walk in the, into the mirror and walk on the refraction, that would be cool. Yeah, and I tried some levels on that. And yeah, cool. so it, it totally makes a point digital. <laughs> you had that tech. You just, you had the system in your, in your pocket and you were like, oh, I'm just gonna use it for this. <laughs> yeah, but the game itself is really uh, like uh, flexible and easy to do paper prototype. Oh yeah, yeah that's the point. Yeah. so. Before we have this mechanism, we buy some mirror to do the to do paper prototyping. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow, cool. Mirror prototyping. I love Real it. mirror prototype. Yeah. 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 Very analog. And so is that how you design the puzzles? Is that how you figure out what puzzles would work in the game? You just sort of like used a mirror with like a little figure in your room, or how did you go you about using that mirror to make the levels for the game? Oh, we have like grid papers, and then uh, we <laughs> draw on the grid, and then use the I use like a little figure um, to walk on the like grid, and then use the mirror to like, figure out uh, the whole like structure. Mm -hmm. And then play a mirror there to see where where I put the mirror will make an interesting structure. So yeah. yeah, so smart. And so you had your your advisor on this game was one of the the great video game puzzle designers, John Blow. What was his feedback like? <laughs> oh, his uh, feedback, he... honest. He have a very cool feedback. Yeah, first of all. And, yeah, what's anything yeah. surprising you weren't expecting or? You know? Yeah, I think he is a puzzle design guy because he, he, if I, if I uh, show him this game, he will definitely teach me a lot of about level uh, puzzle design. But actually what he said is very uh, surprising. He said that you need to fix all the obstacles that, uh, that design puzzle solving so that you can have the players enjoy your puzzle. So that means that the control, okay. I think he said that the control is bad, I know. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but really, he, this is very useful. And then we try a lot to fix this control. And finally, we have this ruler that, yeah, that feels a lot better before, yeah. Because previously, we do not have this ruler. We just have a button here. You click it and you move a step, and click it and move a step. The yeah, ruler's very, new. Yeah. The ruler's a new addition? From from what I've seen, what? Oh, from what you're seeing? Oh, this is the ruler. You you can see the ruler right now. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. And what stage of the, the development did you add the ruler? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a. It, it's pretty long before maybe two months ago. Yeah. yeah. This is the the final decision of the control and UI. Yeah. I like it. I like the visual <laughs> feedback. I like that we see what you're doing. We can see what the user is doing even if we're not playing. Like clearly mm. you're sliding over a ruler or you're sliding yeah. over a mirror. You know how long you're sliding it over for. The puzzle, the, the act of solving the puzzle becomes very outwardly readable to, to viewers. I think that's cool. And so tell us about the, the future of this game. I know that uh, you have uh, got some good news about the, the near future for it. Do you wanna, do you wanna share? Uh, we, uh, luckily we got into the incubator so we are gonna uh, yeah. keep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Greg so... is an incubator alumni, <laughs> NYU Game Center incubator <laughs> alumni. So uh, obviously, uh, you're in yeah. good company. Uh, we are gonna keep working on it uh, during the summer, and then like keep developing more puzzles. We are planning on having a hundred of levels. Yeah. yeah, it's really challenging, <laughs> but you can do it. Sure. Yeah, two hundred's yeah. great. <laughs> How many do you have now? Number. Yeah, right. We have we 30. have around yeah thirty. Thirty. Okay, you know. Okay. So does do you think you can get another seventy levels out of the mechanics you have, or do you think you're going to be adding additional mechanics to the game to get to that? We will have new. We will have new mechanics. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Just ahead of the next mechanic will be that you use the reflection of the world under you. This. There's many, yeah. I imagine there's yeah. many directions this will go and many you'll discover as you continue to make, you know, explore the concept further. So yeah, those next 70 mm -hmm. levels are gonna be a fun, a fun <laughs> ride for you. Yeah. Well, what, yeah. I wanna play all of them. <laughs> <laughs> what is your target platform? Do you see this uh, being a console game or, or PC or uh, mobile? What is sort of your, your goal for, for your first platform? 
Uh, right now, it's uh, we we focused on PC, but we think this game is really like have a great potential to be on uh, mobile. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Seems yeah, we like are designing it and make from outside. I think the tech is there. I think you're the. It seems like you could you could make it work. You know, there's there's a certain degree of of work that would need to be done just to get it on all platforms. But you've got the tools, and uh, if you've got a solid system and and people are liking it, you'll you'll get it there. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you showing Thank us your you. work and congratulations, yeah, congratulations on getting in the incubator. Thank you. Really and strong. On, uh, Thank on you. Graduating. Yeah. Really strong. And next up is the game Archer Project. Mm All right, and we are back with Archer Project by Whalex Who and Sky Huang. Uh, Whalex, you want to tell us about the game? Yeah, so uh, Archer Project is a game where you're trapped in a deserted castle and you have to use grappling hook and arrows to get on the top of the tower. Awesome, let's check out this trailer. Really appropriate use of the oboe for like a deserted <laughs> castle theme. <laughs> really, you. really on on theme use of. For those of you who might not know on the stream, uh, Greg is a classical musician, uh, celloist. Oh. Uh, so yeah, he knows what he's talking about here. <laughs> Actually, the music is taken from Octopath Traveler. <laughs> ah. Yeah. You know what? It's still a great fit for the trailer. It, Don't fit, it works. It yeah. totally works. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, this looks super fun. This looks like a playground. This, uh, uh, I just want to explore this castle. I want to go in. So I have yeah. explored this castle recently. Uh, you know, humble brag, I got to 105% completion, just saying. Wow. Uh, but I don't know if that's as high as you can go, but uh, that was as high as I got. And I really enjoyed how the different mechanics, you know, there's these first you start with very limited abilities and you start to level up, you get these new tools uh, and they really fit together and it's very intuitive how you figure things out. 
Uh, and the levels are designed so well so that, you know, you can go back to a place you've already been with your new tools and discover new regions. How did that whole process go in terms of figuring out how to design it while designing the tools and then designing the levels so that it all fit together so well? Yeah, this looks super fun. So yeah, we start from like uh, making the core mechanics, like the wall climbing, like the shooting arrows and grappling hook stuff. And then we uh, make a sandbox level and uh, which to test all the mechanics and to make sure we have the full skill set uh, ready in place. And then we start to make levels. Like we put the levels into three sections and we make each one by one and then we test it and make sure it feels good. And then we combine them together and put it into this this place and it feels like open and it connected and there are many secret paths and it feels great. So what is an ex what's an inspiration for you in, in making something like this? Uh, like what do you consider the gold standard for like traversing levels and maybe using grappling hooks? Like what, what games do you like to play that do that? Uh, the first inspiration is from Overwatch because I enjoy playing as Hanzo. It's a high tech uh, okay. moment. All right. So that's why. And, and then I feel like there are many games especially single player games that use uh, a bowman protagonist mm. and then i start i start from that point and because i love playing like dishonored and prey they all yeah. features like verticality in levels and also love dark it. souls yeah provide many shortcuts that's why i uh start from this and then we make the level start from a linear level and then open up gradually we introduce new uh, skills and then make shortcuts and provide multiple ways for, to proceed. Yeah, that's the way I do so it. So where are you ultimately, Can are you allowed to say where you're going in this castle or you, it's, do you not want to give it away? Uh, th there's a tower in this castle and your goal is to reach the top of that tower. And there's also, there's a narrative element to this game, right? I don't, but I don't want to, I'm not going to reveal the, the, the secrets of the game, but mm -hmm. uh, it feels very connected to our times. You know, you're alone in this castle. I know this has come up a bunch of times uh, mm -hmm. in this stream, but you're alone in this castle. And but this game even has there's there's a play going on, right? That that is part of that narrative. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that inspired by current events, or is that just sort of uh, the, the coincidence that 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 became that was the theme, and then the world? Uh, it's, not it's not Actually, a coincidence. It's not. Actually, yeah, <laughs> kind of inspired by this weird time with the pandemic and we're all quarantined and just in our alone. castles yeah <laughs> and in also this background castles. yeah it has something to do with the pandemic and yeah no i think that that, that definitely i mean i felt that and, and you know mm -hmm. but I've, i i i couldn't tell if it was me bringing something to it that wasn't there because there's lots of games that i've been playing recently or especially student games who, who've been developed during this time and i'm like oh this feels like and then i was like well, actually we started that eight months ago and it was totally unrelated but this game really i i i, I didn't think it was me bringing that uh, something that wasn't there but i really it did seem like it matched that and so i'm glad to hear that uh Mm -hmm. Not that inside my head with the crazy pandemic stuff. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> it was actually it's subconscious. Sometimes you're just making it and you realize, oh, wow, this is actually my life right now. <laughs> yeah. Because, like, when we started this project, uh, it's like last summer and there aren't any, like, COVID 19 stuff going on. So mm. when we have into the, into the finish and then this pandemic happened and we are just about to, like, write narrative for the game and then we'll, we'll feel like, it's a good match. We can put this situation into the game because we don't have really have the time or manpower to implement uh, combat mechanics. And I did implement a uh, stealth enemy AI. And but if I really want to make the game feel, all, all feels good, I have mm -hmm. to get rid of that part because if I involve that part, I have to implement all of other stuff to make them fit well together. So yeah, is, is I like team this. Sorry, go ahead, Gregory. Um, is your teams across many time zones, or are you still kind of in the same? Like, could you get up at sunrise together and kind of work on Zoom, or or did did you scatter the globe? Uh, actually, we are very like because we have a proper way of separating our works, and we don't like really uh, interfere with each other because uh, Sky is like studio artist, and I'm game designer and game programmer, and mm -hmm. I can do a uh, sketch up gray box models and after i did all the layout she just like uh, replaced the mesh with the final mesh and 
but still maintaining the collision information in the level. So we don't really like, I have to wait for her work to integrate into the game. So we can avoid that, that situation. And that is one of the great things about the game is that it's always clear sort of what's interactable, how there's not, that is one of the things that can be challenging in a game like this is, you know, it's unclear, you know, wh where you can use what tools and, and how to be able to interact with it. But I feel like in this game, that was never a problem for me as a player. I was always sort of clear where I could go, what I could do. Um, and the, even there were hints in the environment of like, you don't have the thing you need yet, but there will be something there mm -hmm. later, which I always enjoy when games sort of telegraph things like that, because as a player, it, it keeps you from getting frustrated and, and it sort of drives you forward uh, to more and new interesting places. So uh, I thought that was really well done. Uh, what do you Thank see? You. As, uh, we're, we're, so if you want to play this game, can I get it right now? Is it available? We're, we're, I, I have played yeah, it. Yeah, I want to play it. it. Like, yeah, can Greg play this game? Can people on the stream play this game? Yeah, you can download it like from the our each page right now. Just awesome. upload it. And I think that'll be in the stream shortly. So we'll probably post. Yeah, I can see the link. I I can see the link right now. Just yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. That link. Yeah, can you can you link. give away playtime, or is that is it <laughs> up to us? Uh, what do you mean by give away playtime? Oh, like what do you what would you say is like an average playtime for this? As in its oh, how it's long like, is? It? For me, like this video, this uh, gameplay <laughs> footage is recorded by my, myself, and it takes me like around eight minutes. Yeah, this is making me feel the bad. Game. <laughs> and with full completion, the full complete a score is like 107 percent. So try not time, to. Oh, 107. I missed something. Yeah, you maybe miss, miss, miss a note. Yeah, but like for oh, for man. new players, it generally it normally took like around half an hour. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's cool. what it took me. Yeah, I definitely didn't take me more than an hour. What, you you no. may just miss this this note just. No, I got that one. I got this one. Oh, you got that one. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So I don't know which note I missed. I missed one somewhere, okay. but uh, now I'm going to go back and search the whole castle for it. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, mm -hmm. This game is a ton of fun. Uh, congratulations Archer. on graduation and congratulations on Archer Project. Thank you. Uh, Bravo. Coming up next uh, is Hot Pot for One from Rachel Lee. Yeah, and Hot Pot in. for One. Hot Pot. So we are back with Rachel Lee and Jin Yin uh, with their project Hot Pot for One. Tell us about Hot Pot for One. Um, so Hot Pot for One is a first person game about being stuck at home on a cold Christmas night and trying to get through it by cooking Hot Pot, which is a hot dish usually intended for a party of people. But tonight it's just you. <laughs> yep, <laughs> for me. <laughs> just you, let's watch this trailer. Hi Rachel, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, just making hot pot at home. That sounds delicious. How many people are there? It's just me, of course. Who else could be here? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You must be feeling so lonely. What are you talking about? It's great. I'm having beef, shrimp, enoki, and all the best stuff, all to myself. Are you sure you are okay with that? Yeah, well, you know how it is. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Always makes every time I see the trailer, I get hungry. Uh, doesn't help that I awesome. have lunch. It's almost dinner time. 
I really uh, like. Oh, sorry. No, no, go, go. <laughs> I really like that you kind of don't. You kind of keep it ambiguous as to how the player feels about ho- having Hot Pot alone. You know, it's, it seems like you know the joy of cooking, the joy of the food, uh, the way it looks, the way you've presented it, the, the detail you've given in this apartment, the the um, the narrative unique little fine points like there's so much there that i i play tested an earlier build of this so i i'm i'm seeing its new form or its updated form it's there's so much love you put into this that like yes you could eat hot pot alone and still be okay like there's the nyu rules for for something i mean yeah it's it's so cozy it's like cozy and it's feel it's like it's okay to eat hot pot for one yeah, and, and that's that's true for some people too. Like some, because this game is inspired by uh, our experience as being international students, and and you sometimes you get lonely and you miss home because you're far away from your friends and family, and eating um, food from home is like a way to comfort yourself, and that's what we sometimes do, and just like cook hot pot at home by yourself because you really miss the flavor. Now, this, this always makes me think about like, like to, to like contextualize it for myself is like I'm in a foreign country and it's Thanksgiving and nobody outside of America cares about Thanksgiving, and I'm like making Thanksgiving dinner for myself but nobody else cares. <laughs> like that's always like was like sort of my mental model for. Does that work for sort of a uh, an American uh, centric viewpoint of this? Well, I mean, like it's similar because like here, no one really celebrates like Chinese New Year as well. So like. And it's always uh, school time when that happens. So, um, so that's like some of us just get together and have like a small party. But like other than that, like there's really no celebration here. And yeah, I guess yeah, definitely relate to that. What you're saying. I really like this text approach. This I've not seen this before, where you don't even have text. You just use pictures. You show yeah. and not <laughs> tell. I love it. It's like it's all there I can take it all in like it clearly there's a there's a distance that your friends over here you're over there your battery's about to die on the phone like you just gotta make a hot pot <laughs> and Chin did all the amazing illustrations yeah I love the background by the way Chin very very appropriate for uh, mm-hmm. for this yeah um the, the the feeling of being alone again this you know this theme has come up a lot you know eating alone being forced to be alone in, in the trailer you even sort of allude to the fact that you don't have an option of not having hot pot alone uh, right now uh but this is a project that started before this was a requirement has that changed or informed the process at all how things have, have changed during you know this year-long thesis project um i mean we started off not really i would say like we started off with just a scene of like a pot of water cooking and, and like both of us saw, saw it and it was like this is promising and I, I love this feeling like we should just make it into a game and I love, from, yeah and we just added on from that I love that an idea for a game can come from just a simple yeah. I, you know concept or, or a, a thing in action you know a boiling pot of water then becomes this this open door and when you walk through it, here we are, it's hot pot for one, it's all this food, it's it's cooking, it's fellowship, it's friendship, it's distance. Uh, you feel it, you hear it in the music choices you use in the game. Um, the steam coming out of the pot, the winter, the fact that it's like a holiday, so there's loaded stuff around that. This is rich, it's rich stuff. Rich and there's food. something so intimate about cooking, right? And it's good, Greg, I mean, you also have cooking in, in, in your games. It does really feels like you know you're you're saying something about who you are as you're cooking this, right? So, what what is if you were playing this game, what would be the hot pot you'd actually make for yourself? I would go for I'd go right for the chicken legs, uh, <laughs> and I would probably overload it and um, <laughs> probably add some of that lettuce. I mean, you just give us a lot of cool options here. I also am learning about the cuisine. I'm learning, you know, what is this? What is used? I, I'm interested in the mushroom options over on the right. Uh, is that ginger in the corner? I mean, it's like, as somebody that that is, is coming into this, not used to this sort of cuisine, you know, oh, there's some shrimp, like, Ooh, it's, it's, it. it's I, okay, yeah, riding, riding the shrimp. <laughs> I mean, it, 
it helps me put the player in the shoes of, of this person and you know the environmental detail in the room reinforces their their life their experience their relationships i mean that's rich stuff and uh and then the gameplay and the act of cooking the, the sort of meditative aspect of that um and then you know these these thought bubbles providing some some narrative context so uh, poignant thank you this is obviously a very personal game and it's very much about your experience, but it's a personal game, but also a shared experience by a large population of people. What has the reaction been when you played it for people who have similar backgrounds, you know, that, how do they feel about this? Do they, they, do they empathize with it? How does it sort of resonate with them? Uh, I remember at some like earlier play tests uh, when we still had a lot of problem with our narrative structure, we have the, uh, the important person which we refer to as her and she in our game. We try to not to say what that person is. And people who play it, uh, they interpret that her or she as uh, the protagonist's uh, like boyfriend or, sorry, a girlfriend or the mother or a sister. Like, yeah, they can really like relate to their own experience or memories of their life. Is there is there a right answer to that? Is it or was it left specifically ambiguous so that people could sort of bring their own baggage to it? Uh, uh yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's ambiguous. You'll find out in the game. Just yeah, if you yeah. play. It. Oh, sorry, spoilers. <laughs> spoilers. It is gonna be cute. Well, so if, when people do want to play this game, uh, where do they find it? How do they play it? And then sort of what what is the what's next for Hot Pot for one? Uh, yes, it's available on our itch page uh, right now. And and we are not really sure what we're gonna do it um, next. Like we might take a break from it because <laughs> we've been working for for like almost a year now. But um, we might, I don't know, uh, release on Steam or something like that. Because we, we feel like it's a we spent a lot of, a lot of time on it, and we're we're really proud of it. So we want to get it out there. Well, it's really beautiful and it's clear that the, the passion that you have for this project and the love and care you've taken in, in developing it, uh, it's really, it really feels like we're getting a glimpse into you're sharing part of yourself with us when you're sharing this game with us. Uh, and so for that, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and, Food and relationships. Uh, yeah. Food yeah. and relationships. I think my hot pot would be almost entirely meatballs, I guess I would say. Uh, Rachel, Chin, you want to just leave us with what your, your hot pot would be? Uh, just beef. Just beef. Oh, beef. <laughs> just beef. Yep. Chin, Yun, what's yours? Um, I think most, I love vegetables more than meats. So all the vegetables and plus beef. Make us look bad over here. The, the player chooses. <laughs> Player decides. Yeah, she, she is the only person I know who puts uh, broccoli in her hot pot. <laughs> Sounds great to me. Yeah, you know what? I I'll thought it would that. be healthier if she was uh, making my hot pot for me than if I was making it for myself. <laughs> well, thank you Just, so much for sharing your work with us. This is, uh, you know, really makes us. It's really sort of it feels really nice to be sort of it feels like we've been invited into your home a little bit by just uh, being able to see this game and, 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 and this is and, yeah this is just mellowing me out this is <laughs> thank you thank you for all the comments and yeah, but thank you for hosting <laughs> well thank you for thanking me okay that's <laughs> enough of that uh thank you rachel and chin uh we're gonna move on to our next game free agency So we are back with Brian S. Chung, and he's going to tell us about his game Free Agency. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, so Free Agency is the life simulation game where the agents within it are gradually becoming self-aware and trying to find meaning in their own lives. But meanwhile, you've got to keep them too busy to think about it.
heavy stuff. <laughs> very, very uh, uh, appropriate for now. You know, again, it, another one of these games where it feels more appropriate now than than ever before. That you know, we're literally just seeing each other through little windows on the screen. Maybe we are living in a simulation, Brian. First question: Are we living in a simulation? Mm. Well, you can never uh, really know the truth about that. You can sort of perform tests and ask yourself questions, but no matter what the result, you know, can test I hypothesis, ask, you just don't know. Can I ask what uh, got you rolling on this idea? This this is so interesting. I feel like it's what, where did this spark occur for you here? Uh, I suppose it's been a long time coming. I mean, our whole lives, we like go through all this this stuff, I mean, there's some point of like awareness, maybe as a little kid or when you're older, when you're trying to wonder if what you're seeing is real. Um, you know, all sorts of pop culture obviously feed into it. The Matrix, the Truman Show. Um, but I think uh, with this game specifically and with games, uh, simulation games really kind of strike a nerve because, um, you know, they, they're usually designed as like a grind and they pull you into it and you start getting into these systems. So when you play something like The Sims and I like was grinding like piano level eight, level nine, level 10 on, on my little mm -hmm. Sim and then she died. Um, you Not know, it just, just kind of hit me a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I started thinking about how I learned a little bit of piano, but I, you know, I stopped at some point and then, you know, you just think about these things. It's interesting. Wow, it's dark. The, the Sims, you're creating their house, right? You're creating their reality. I mean, in, a, in game design, you're creating the space that the player traverses, and eventually they find the edges of it if they want to, uh, visually or, or spatially. Um, and then these these characters in this game, are they all? Do they all think that this is their lives? Just this this room, four walls, five walls. And you're just preventing them from ever knowing that there's more than that, or, or you know, what is the ultimate? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's like part of the thing, and there was a little tease of it in the end of the trailer there, where there was this guy in like an outdoor scene. Um, so in the storyline, he sort of stumbles his way out there, and um, you know, everything goes to the edge of the screen, and when he walks around, like the camera moves along with him. To him, that's like totally new and different. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, and then, so he says in there, like, this, is this the real world? Um, and then he goes back and tries to tell everyone about it. They don't believe him. He's a photographer, so he takes camera, he takes like photographs, um, but you know, they just look like photographs. Uh, so there's this sort of, it's kind of like the, uh, the allegory of the cave uh, of like Plato. Um, and sort of the whole game is about a lot of these skeptical hypotheses. Um, there's, there's that one, the brain in the vat, uh, the omphalos, uh, the simulated reality hypothesis and um, the dream argument they're all they're all in there somehow are we as the player helping him or preventing him from telling his colleagues that they're in a simulation so at first um, if you like look at some of this gameplay it's it's all about nurturing these people and sort of having them grow into their roles and their hobbies and their careers um, like the person on the screen right now is is an unemployed chef and then she sort of grows into creating like a cooking show from home um, and you know the person playing the piano gets better at it and that's sort of the beginning of it, but it, it sort of progresses into a point where you don't want them to become too self-aware. So then you start bringing them down a little bit, like in the first scene of the trailer when you set the guy's telescope on fire. So uh, there's a lot of like really interesting philosophy here, but you also did something really interesting in just how you landed on this idea. Uh, and so there was a, there's this process that was not the sort of typical student game design process. Do you want to talk about the sort of player centric way that you came up with the, this sort of approach? Yeah, I, I don't even know if I could call it player centric. It was it was pretty <laughs> unusual. Um, so I guess in, in the short summary of it is that um, to decide what game to make next, uh, we took a bunch of prototypes, basically fake gameplay videos, made like 10 second clips of games that didn't really exist, but they were made to look like they were, you know, clips from a game uh, and made up an elaborate system of posting them online with different aliases, uh, completely anonymously, same time of day, same day of the week, etc. in order to sort of just 
let it like let it happen and then just committing in advance to uh picking and and working on whichever one gets the most upvotes and comments uh so in a way this whole thing is a little bit self-reflexive in that like we were just giving up our uh, sort of our free will in the matter and just letting it happen strategy. through this experiment of um like external forces and it was I mean, I think part of it was to try to come up with some kind of like market validation scheme. Um, scheme. You know, it's kind of a bubble <laughs> when you show off your prototypes to your friends or to, you know, fellow designers who have the same taste as you. Um, so we wanted to sort of remove that element um, and just create like a simulation of like what strangers are like. <laughs> um, but what it turned out to be was really interesting was that it, it really changed the way I think I thought about uh, making games and making decisions about how to make games. Um, yeah, just to really just undo all of my pre-assumptions about what people like. And um, what would I think be that an was pretty powerful to me. So what was an assumption you had that got subverted using that method, for example? Well, um, it was like assumptions about certain games or prototypes that we made. I'd showed them to people before doing this. And then everybody had differing opinions about, oh, this one's got a really cool art style. Like people are gonna love this one. Uh, this one's like, this one's in a popular genre, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there were always surprises every time. Um, and, you know, we just don't know what, <laughs> you know, we just don't know what's real. We don't know what the, the actual actuality out there of like just, masses of people versus, you know, this tiny bubble of, of what we know and the people that we know. So do you think this is the process that you'll use for all your games going forward? Or do you, you want to see how free agency <laughs> works out when you're finished with it? Or is there, <laughs> a, uh, is there a balance there? Yeah, part of the plan was to fin was to see how this works out. Um, I don't think I'll do such an elaborate experiment. Uh, in reality, the data site, the, the sample sites are still pretty small. Um, but I think it definitely changed the the order and the process of which I would prototype um, doing things visually first. Uh, I think in the old way, I probably would have just uh, hunkered down onto like game feel mechanics, like uh, th things with like little squares moving around uh, for a long time and really iron that out before trying to put like polish in there. Um, but that's actually I think that might work for certain types of games, but for a game that's very conceptual like this, I think um, kind of going upside down approach uh, makes makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I love that idea of just trying to see if, uh, do people connect with this, even yeah. if it's not a real thing, is a, a fake gameplay you know, video, uh, is that something that inspires people to want to play? And if so, then maybe that's the game I should make rather than fiddling around with mechanics or something that is yeah. a little bit more high level than that. Uh, so people can play this game now, right? The, the, the current version of it is, is available? Well, so um, you can, like what's on the screen now, you can wishlist it on Steam. Uh, the public demo will be widely available during the Steam Gaming Festival, uh, which starts on June 9th. So starting that time, you can download it directly, download the demo directly from Steam. And um, you could follow our progress on, uh, you know, through the other links on the screen right now. Yeah, so Steam wishlisted. Also, I got to say, I love the old school Mac OS from like the 90s uh, <laughs> aesthetic that you've got going on there. Is it is this like a piece out of time? Is this play, is this a period piece? Does it take place in the in the 90s or is it? Uh, it does. Well, I, I think it's I think I'm trying to draw from like various time periods to create this like sort of it's got a pastiche, like a collage kind of yep. look and a feel to it. And so I want to try to you know, sort of trigger people's memories about uh, about past operating systems and also current times. So there's a yeah. mix in there of rotary phones, but also flat screen TVs, uh, connected internet. It's a router, but a modem sound comes on and it's, it's just this Three. kind of uh, world. Yeah. Flat isometric style, definitely getting <clears throat> the Sims 1 vibes, mm -hmm. you know, that 2000s, like millennium, pre-millennium tension, pre-millennium, like what's gonna happen. Uh, yeah, clip art style. Very cool. Very, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> well, thanks so much thanks, for sharing. Brian. Congratulations, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Pleasure talking to you. And for making such a great game. And thank you for joining us. And yeah, rad. Us on the sure. stream. Quick cool. shout out to my partner, GJ Lee, who also works on this game. She's in the chat. And shout outs to both of you because you've, you 
we've seen you both over the, over the years and the, the breadth of your output has been super different and interesting with every game. So you always surprise me with the Chiefs Meow. So bravo. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so that's the wraps. I can't believe it's over, uh, Greg, but the, that's our time. That wraps up our segment of the show. It really flew by. Uh, but please stick around. There's more MFA thesis games to come in the next hour. Uh, and Greg, thank you so much for joining me here and giving such great feedback to all of our students. Uh, I'm really excited to go back to watching the stream now and seeing uh, all the next presentations that are about to come up. In your castle alone. <laughs> yes, in my castle alone that I traverse with a grappling hook to go eat hot pot by myself while I live in a simulation and clean up after. Okay, it's starting to fall apart. I'm just going to end there. Thank Embrace you, everybody. Embrace it, Pat. Embrace it. <laughs>
and I'm one of the full-time faculty here at the NYU Game Center and I'm going to be your host until 7 p.m. or so uh, and I'm really excited to show you the next um, set of games. So um, this uh, particular set of games is really exciting because we have games that have done their research, uh, they're experimental, but they've also managed to become and mean something completely different from what they started to mean. And the circumstances in which we're in uh, kind of make them um, resonate with us much more. Uh, so we have games that have like social satire, we have games about AI, we have documentary, Three games and we have uh, games that are also very poetic and very uh, touching. Um, it's it's going to be really exciting because we can uh, see, for example, you know, games where we can drive around Beijing right before the pandemic hit. Uh, we can reminisce of uh, what it feels to uh, touch and be with others. Um, you know, like this, these games are going to really touch your soul. So I'm really, you know, happy to to be hosting this segment. Uh, and, you know, we're really proud to see our students to, you know, how they've managed to produce work that is going to be meaningful and we'll probably find uh, space in all your hearts. And for the first uh, part of the segment, uh, we have the pleasure to have Nina Freeman uh, to come and comment and talk uh, on our students' games. Uh, Nina is an alumna of NYU, uh, of our uh, sister program in IBM. Uh, but also she took a lot of classes with us, so this is kind of like a homecoming for her. And she's done her share of uh, personal work with games, you know, like How Do You Do It and Sybil. And she's also a seasoned streamer and a fantastic game developer. So, you know, welcome, Nina. We're really happy to have you here. Yay, Yay Nina. Okay. So welcome. How are you doing? Oh, you I love to be muted. It's my favorite state of being. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> yes. I start every stream that way. I always start muted. Yeah, and this is it's the least that can happen. You know, we're live. <laughs> this is what happens, right? Um, so we're going to start uh, with our first game of this segment, which is Experiment Six Five Five Three Six. Uh, and it's a, a set of dystopian web games. So stay tuned, back in a second. Right, so we're back. Um, we have Chuang Jie and Rachel Wang who are going to present other games, uh, experiment sixes, six, five, five, three, six. Um, so do you want to give us a brief description of what we're going to see in a minute? Yeah, sure. So Experiment 65536 is a series of dystopian web games created with the help of the latest AI technologies such as speech synthesis, semantic analysis, and facial emotion recognition. All right, so let's watch the trailer. Okay. Since the beginning of time, experiments have never been absent in human history being carried out to support, refute, and validate hypotheses. Experiments provided insight into cause and effect, and demonstrated that everything is doomed to its own destiny, ranging from chemistry, biology, and psychology. Eventually experiments peaked to a new height, as computer science's strength was revealed completely. 
while initially used to save lives from wars, and to provide CS tenures and PhD seats in the university. With the blessing from deep learning, AI experiments have shaped our society to its ultimate ideology. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this experiment, and this gives life to thee. All right, so it follows its gameplay. Is that clear? Yes. Yep. So you want to tell us what is going on and you know, so that people get a, a sense of, of what the game is? OK, sure. So the experiment 65536 is a series of games. So currently, we are presenting the second one, which is 65537. The main focus is facial emotion recognition. So as you can see, the players will be presented with a series of fake newspapers, those newspapers we made up. So you're supposed to, to provide your quote, correct expressions through the webcam. So there's only one correct answer and you will gradually know what the regime wants you to answer. So this is basically the, uh, the, the workflow, but actually, this is not the focus of this game because in the later part of this game, you will be accidentally presented with a real newspaper. I mean, literally the real newspaper of the day, like the New York Times of the day. And then this system will pretend, oh, this is a mistake. But later on, you will know this is the real focus because this system wants you to, to label the real newspaper as fake news. <laughs> yeah, that is the basic logic of this game. All right. So you're with this game, you're really putting people on the spot, you know, like this is about, you know, you using the webcam, you using, you know, uh, mm. like, you know, AI to engage people. Like how, how have people responded so far? You know, are, how, how much unsettled did they become? Uh, yeah, I, I think this part is very interesting because, you know, this is also a mimic of how those people are using AI nowadays because I don't know if you've ever heard of this story about a company that's trying to tout in their technology, their AI technology of using AI as customer service. So actually they're using some, they're hiring some um, real human beings in developing countries, but they're saying this AI. And also we, we have seen a lot of people are using a lot of ways to use the AI to do some I don't want to use the word bad, but at least it's very controversial to use AI to do the censorship. So this is the real topic this game wants to talk about, I think. Right. Nina, you have any questions? Uh, I just want to say I, I got to play a little of this game before the stream. Uh, and it. <laughs> I like that you're addressing some serious topics and also made me laugh a couple times during the game. I really appreciated that. It's like. You know, we're talking about this AI stuff that can be used to really manipulate people. And you're definitely toying with like that idea while also making some like very like game references and stuff that made me laugh. Like with the in the first game of the set that I played, there was those like shooter mechanics reference and stuff, which really like surprised me in the moment. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is very like a self-aware game, which I enjoyed. And I really enjoyed a game called Eliza last year that's also sort of addressing yeah. this kind of AI related stuff. Um, yeah. And it's cool to see more work being done on that topic. So kudos for that. So for this game, like what are your future plans? Like do you have like two experiments? Are you going to develop more experiments? Um, what, what, where are you trying to get this game to? There yes. was originally a third part of the game that we haven't got time to start. And we're thinking in the future we might start to work on it. Yes, as you can see that the naming here is a mess. I mean, this game is called Experiment 65536, but the first experiment is six, the second is seven. So we are following the naming convention of the United States Navy. It's like the United States aircraft carrier, Jerry Ford class, is named after the first vessel of this class. So we will make a bunch of experiments following this convention. It's like we have 655, 36, 7, 8, 9, and et cetera. 
Have you planned those ones out already and stuff? Like, are they sort of paper prototyped ahead of time with the concepts for each experiment or have you been making them kind of like one at a time? I'm curious. Um, we have plans for three, but yeah. further on, well, we don't have currently have any more plans, but we will cool. make more. Very cool. It's like episodic. That's very hot right now, I feel like. So that's fun. <laughs> I love episodic stuff. <laughs> And also one thing that is impressive too is that you are running this as web games, but there's also a lot of you know AI work behind it. This is you know making it run on on your uh, browser is also particularly impressive. How how much of a struggle was that or not? Yeah, it, it's it's really a struggle because I I think um, part of the inspiration of my uh, Inspiration is my experience of attending last year's International AI and Games Summer School, which is in Brooklyn. And I think it's quite interesting that every speaker is talking about a game named Facade. And I think the most interesting thing is that the Facade is a game that has been published like 15 years ago, and it's pretty old. And I just think, oh, maybe what happened during those years, those 15 years, maybe I should make something new, make something with the real and modern AI technologies, which is seems hard, but I think it's easier than it looks, but still a headache for me. <laughs> and uh, one last question, and this is one of the reasons why we had Nina here, but so what we saw is really the opening of the game. So you have videos as being part of it, you know, like, so you shot these videos and you had this kind of robot voice over them. So, so why did you need this kind of like cut scene in front of it? Like how, how does it help getting you to, to the mood that you wanted for the game? Hmm. Richard, do you want to answer this? <laughs> yeah, so um, for the rubbing scenes, um, we just wanted people to feel that this article is actually being erased right at the moment. So that when they are removing their um their attention level from the their monitor um on their computer that is actually erasing so we wanted to feel like it's like in real time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're being watched yeah they're being watched by someone right any last thoughts any last questions nina that you would like to ask uh, I just want to say I really liked the trailer. It seems like it incorporated, was that found footage or did y'all make that originally? Or I was curious about that. No, most of them are found footages from cool. old documentaries or experiment videos. That's awesome. I feel like more devs should take advantage of that kind of stuff because there's a lot of found footage out there that you can take advantage of that's free and open to use. So I thought that that was really clever and set the tone really nicely. So yeah. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> And I forgot to mention that all the background music and is, and also including the music in the trailer is composed by Rachel. Oh, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for congratulations, your... uh, Frank and Rachel, for doing such an amazing job. I'm um, graduating with such an amazing project. And uh, we have the URL of your project uh online and i believe that the chat will also have the urls of where to play these games because these games are already online uh so thank you to you both and we'll move on to the next game and in station of touch in a second
Right, and we're back. Uh, our next game is going to be Manifestation of Touch uh, by Brianna Shuttleworth and Eugene Zhu. And um, would you like to introduce your trailer very briefly? Um, well, our game is a art house looking sim about invoking a sense of empathy through a series of short video clips. Uh, normally the game would be played on an iPad and we hope you enjoy the trailer. All right. Let's watch. All right. So this is a really wonderful trailer. Um, and I think that, you know, when I saw it the other day, I was, I think I'm not alone in, in tearing up, you know, I think that when Dumbo appears, uh, it's kind of like, oh my God, what it's like to be outside and be with people. So so let's see if we can have the, 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 the trailer loop silently while we kind of talk about it a bit. Um, so, so this is a this is a game that that's kind of hard to to explain, you know. Like, so, so tell us a bit more, like for people who who will eventually play it, you know, like what is your, um, you know, what will the experience, you know, what is the the premise of this game? Tell us a bit more. Um. Well, the premise, like this game, has changed several times throughout the year. Um. And I think when we entered quarantine, it changed yet again. Uh, before going in, we wanted to just, we found that touching things that you like visually see through film, um, there is something like really evocative in that. Um, and all of a sudden we're put in a world where that kind of touching, even the idea that we were going to like demo this game on an iPad and let a bunch of people touch this iPad, like that idea came like washed out the window. So uh, part of this is just like reminiscing about being able to freely have this experience um, and kind of seeing what life was like, uh, going through like Dumbo, looking at all these clips of these people moving around. There's a couple kissing freely on the street um, and just kind of remembering that feeling. Yeah. We want them to like, just uh, put yourself in this video, let yourself in, um, see whatever you wanted to see and just read, really enjoying this moment of feeling like the touching and everything 
that we lost for a long time. So how far into development was this? So, so, so the idea of like longing for touching was like part of, of being in quarantine. Was that the case? The longing for touch, I would think. Uh, beforehand, we were kind of set on still showing uh, aspects of touch, but it became more of a longing piece uh, once quarantine hit. Yes. You already uh, have the footage? Uh, we had, so the Dumbo scenes are obviously prior, mm -hmm. um, but all of the scenes that take place in a tiny Brooklyn apartment yeah. uh, came after quarantine. Uh, I have a question about that stuff. Are the hands in it your hands, like you two? Did you film yourselves for that? Yeah. 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 I was curious. It's always interesting to know if it's like the devs themselves or if you brought someone else in to film them because, you know. It depends on the person. Some people don't like doing that, but some people are into it. I think it's great. So I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. All acting is done by us. <laughs> cool. That's fun. Yeah, it looks really well filmed too. I like the the like color palettes and stuff you use are really nice um, for that. I know it's really hard to pull off filming on your own, especially if you're doing it at home. Um, so yeah, it looks great. Thank you. So tell us a bit about what your inspirations are, because this is kind of like a mix of game and film and, and you're trying to blend that together you know, in, in, in your work. So, so what did you get? How did you get to to, to make a statement of that? Uh, I think our inspiration uh, coming from a lot of places, technique wise, like the original idea was really just a curiosity of how cameras are using in film. Because we, we figured out like last, semester I took like film making class and I figured out there are a lot of interesting about things about camera using like how you uh do long shots or like how you do like um camera editing stuff like doing montage of this stuff. like very interesting but only technique wise and we are like uh being curious we wanted to know what if we uh enhance this uh thing and put them into gameplay we wanted to know like what this co will coming out of and also we have like some of the like uh, content wise, we have some inspirations, Brianna. Uh, we had a, I come from like a performance art background. So just looking at like Bill Viola, Pina Bosch, just all these uh, performance uh, pieces or video art and trying to really find something special. Like they felt really special and visually stunning to look at and figuring out how we could bring that into games and into some form of like an interaction that's not just uh, what you would see in like a traditional FMV game. So how do you incorporate the touch? You know, this is ideally played on an iPad. So, so what is the touching like? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the touch, our goal is to make something that's like meditative feeling. So when you touch the, the game actually continues playing. So the video is going um, and you're just like guiding your finger around. And the idea is if you go over certain key elements of the video, a uh, new film pops up. So you can kind of guide this, uh, guide the footage and do like selective editing of what you're seeing. You also like you're touching, but also like telling your own story as you, as you play. Yeah. Yes. But it doesn't have like a very strong like narrative. Oh, okay. Does, does, does the touching go beyond the hands? Like, does it go into like other parts of the body at all in the game, or is it mostly just focused on the hands? No, it goes into other parts of the body, a lot of the, on the cool. face, uh, especially. Neat. You put your node, nose up to the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically speaking, you can do that. As yeah. Well, like, <laughs> not touch that is uh, stay or moving slowly. Yeah, you can put them up there. That's cool. Do you think like, obviously you mentioned like, cause right now it's hard to show something like on an iPad at a show, impossible really. Do you think you'll like do multiple versions of the game? Do you hope to like also have that version in the future? Is that something that you're like starting to plan for now or? Um, I think personally it's, this project is a lot of like exploration. So taking what we've learned with this project and now adapting it into something new. Cool. Iteration is good.
Right. Any last comments? Anything that you didn't get to cover? Can hey. I say hi, mom? <laughs> hi, dear mom. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Your mom should be proud. You know. Uh, well, congratulations you know, to both of you for such an amazing job. Uh, again, I think that this is one of those games that has become something you know that is really touching and, and, and important to all of us. So, so thank you so much. Uh, and great. now we're going to go to the next game. Thank you. Um, so, our game. I'm not seeing myself. All right, I'm seeing myself. Uh, our next game is Out for Delivery uh, by Yu Jin Gao. Uh, and it's another uh, full motion video game. This is why we had Nina here, because uh, she has you know, a lot of things to say <laughs> about it. Um, I mean, it's interesting because a, a lot of it is, is kind of like vignettes, which is what mm -hmm. you work on. Uh, yeah. And I'm just really psyched to see students doing film stuff in games because it is a really hard thing, like getting that equipment, um, figuring out how to use it. I faced all those challenges too. So I'm always really impressed when people pull it off. <laughs> yeah, on the one hand, you know, you we do have the advantage of having access to some equipment, but yeah. now with the pandemic a lot of it is gone so yeah yeah that changes it a lot for sure on the production side i totally agree all right so let's move to the next game in a minute All right, so our next game is Out for Delivery uh, by Yu Jing Gao. Uh, she's also worked with two collaborators, uh, Lillian Leng and Guj Bowling, right? Yes. Uh, Yu Jing, would you like to give us a brief intro to your, um, to your trailer, please? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, my game is a 42 minute interactive documentary, follows a slice of life story of a food delivery career in Beijing right before Lunar New Year in 2020, and also happens to be the day that Wuhan city was quarantined because of the uh, pandemic. Um, yeah, that's basically a synopsis of the, of the game. It's shot with 360 video, thus players controlled camera in this panoramic view. Right, so let's watch the trailer. <laughs> Right, so I believe that we have some footage that you wanted to comment on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, you know, you can comment up and we might have ask questions as we go. That's uh, totally cool, yeah. All right, cool, so go ahead. Is, the, is it starting? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to uh, share first the control of the game. Player can control the camera, look around and decide what they wanted to pay attention to. And player also hold this device, a phone that serves as an observational and navigational tool. 
which it records dialogues, shows which text bubble player has already interacted with. Um, this is about 3.30 in the morning. The team of couriers are just doing their routine team building. And they clean up the baskets and take pictures, post on Douyin, which is the Chinese TikTok, to show their managers. So this is how usually they start the day. But today is kind of special because it's the day the Wuhan city was quarantined right at the, around the same time, 10 a.m. in the morning, and they were talking about the quarantine the city, kind of joke about it. Um, so these, uh, the reason I follow these couriers because they sort of make this su super busy 996 style of Beijing living possible. So in the days of pollution or bad traffic, they allow the office workers to hide at home and order delivery food to take to home. And some other similar workers and uh, allow them to order from pharmacy drugs or, and um, other packages to be delivered to the ho to home. So most of the gameplay is sort of like this, pretty delight and light, not heavy at all. Um, however, some parts are intentionally made slow in terms of pacing. It's, um, it's the way that I'm saying that the, the game is not about entertainment, uh, entertaining the players only, it's about showing the couriers labor in a measure of time. So you sort of experience all this with the couriers. This is also when I decided if I should give players like a fast forward or rewind function. Um, eventually I decided, okay, I will make the what's in the game in, engaging instead of giving a player button to, to skip, sort of. Um, I was playing yeah. the other day, and one mm. of the things that you know feels amazing is that you know you're driving outside. You know, I'm cooped up in my apartment in New York, <laughs> and this felt really special. And, um, so, so this idea of like letting the players kind of like slow down is that was this deliberate, or has this come up like as we were all on lockdown? Because I think that now we're learning how to be patient and how to wait. Yeah, and, that's sort yeah. of an interesting take of that. Uh, going outside or living a slower pace, we our lifestyle is changed by 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 the entire stay at, at home orders as well. So this is the thing I wanted to especially maybe point it out, um, because in this scene there are three stories happening simultaneously. Two curious on the side are talking about couldn't pay a reoccurring bill. One at the back um, ordered. Uh, sliced beef but could, didn't get to have his food because new orders came in so he had to leave and the other couriers um, outside the uh, restaurants are uh, resting and playing video games so um, this is uh, what I eventually decided to translate and fully kind of flash out the scenes because um, influenced by Robert's post about video game new realism um, Neorealism uh, neo is uh, part of it is talking about like not only focus on one protagonist, but also have your camera lingered on the world around, around the protagonist, showing out more of the world, so you can see um, things besides just this one person. Um, yeah, so this is a pretty uh, what I would describe as a delight. And funny at times I unexpectedly break your heart game but those moments that would break your heart are totally missable and you wouldn't know I promise which I'm very proud of so um, I hope everyone can enjoy this game. I have a question about it uh, for those moments where there's like a couple conversations happening simultaneously mm -hmm. do you expect like players will maybe like be focusing on one conversation and then like see one out of the corner of their eye and like replay the game to see that other one or have you noticed players like moving from one to the other because they like they're like oh no I'm really excited about this one so they're more like switching gears in the moment I'm curious which occurs um, with your game looks really cool Well, if you should freeze, no. Oh no. no. <laughs> oh no. No, no but I, I know from having played it is that yeah. conversations are yes. in the town. 
I'm the sorry. Kind of like oh, catch welcome up. back. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, my internet. It happens. Yeah. Uh, I missed the second half half of the question. You said uh, in the shot one several things happening spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Do I ex expect player to uh, to to what? I missed that. Part. Oh, I was just wondering if you've noticed if players sort of like are watching a conversation and then notice one they're excited about and just like instantly go to it, or are they replaying the game multiple times to like see all the different um, opportunities of conversations that are happening simultaneously? I'm just wondering how that plays out. Uh, right now, not enough play tests have been done for this. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't have a personal observation of it, uh, but I do notice when I was watching the, the dialogues, that sometimes I would miss some something because it's not always happening in front of me. That's also the use of the phone in, in the in the game. It's kind of a comforting device to tell you that you don't panic if you miss something. It will be recorded here. Just keep going, keep looking. That's great. That's a really friendly feature. I like I like how that sounds. It's cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, so we're out of time, but uh, congratulations using a thing that this is going to be a real hit up there. Thing oh my this God. Really Thank you. Yeah, it looks yeah. amazing. Super yeah, cool. Good job. Being yeah. outside in a scooter is like such a luxury. So, so thank you for your game. It's been really great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. And thank oh, you, thanks. Clara. Nice meeting you. Yes. Nice meeting you. And uh, we have to say goodbye to Nina, who's been, you know, awesome. Um, it's always so <laughs> nice to see her again. Yeah, it's nice mm -hmm. seeing you too. I haven't seen NYU folks in a while now that I'm on the West Coast, but I miss everyone. I see a lot of familiar names in the chat. Thank you for having me. These games look stellar. I was watching the stream earlier too, and everyone's doing an amazing job. And I hope you're all doing well and safe and, and all that good stuff. So thanks again for having me. Super cool. Of course, and we'll follow you. We get to see you on your own stream here on Twitch. Yeah, I stream all the time. <laughs> Hentai oh, PhD. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Nina. We're going to move to the next game. It's going to be Palimpsest by Elizabeth Bayou. So stay tuned. We'll be back in a minute. Right. So before we move into the next game, I'm going to introduce our next guest, uh, Mary Claire LeBlanc Flanagan, who was our artist in residence in the fall at the NYU Game Center. And she is such a delight to have around that we could not have the show uh, without her. Uh, we actually talked about like things to do in the show, right? You make this like small game on what to do when we're doing a showcase. Uh, and I'm sure that, that she's coming up with a new thing to do. Uh, so, you know, she's a fantastic designer and one of the most inspiring people I've met. So welcome, Marie. Yes. Hi, Clara. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here. Um, I feel like I'm reaching out and touching you in a way that is permissible right now. <laughs> Giving you a hug. Um, yes. Yeah. I feel so lucky to be here. We have some like amazing games. Uh, I, I, I am delighted to see them and, uh, and to be back amongst these wonderful people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about having you come to the showcase. We didn't realize it would be like this, but we <laughs> are really, really delighted to have you. This is such a treat. Um, so let's welcome our uh, next uh, MFA. A graduate, uh, Elizabeth Bayou, who uh, has made this amazing documentary game 
called palimpsest. Um, let me see, is she around? Yes, Elizabeth, welcome. Hi. Hi. How are you all? We're good. We're really excited. This has been an intense afternoon, but I find that you know, all smiling and these games are amazing, like your own. So, uh, Elizabeth, would you like to introduce your uh, trailer very briefly? Sure. Um, so, Palimpsest is a journalism game and digital museum about the history of white supremacy in Charlottesville prior to um, 2017, which is when the Unite the Right rally occurred. Um, and so the trailer is just meant to set the mood and um, give people a little bit of an idea of um, the kinds of environments that the game will feature. All right, so let's watch the trailer. Why did you make this game? Because when I was a student at UVA, living in Charlottesville, there was so much I didn't realize about the erasure of anyone who wasn't certain dead white men. And it was all baked into these places where I lived and worked, you know? And then the rally happened and I started to talk to people and interview them. My name is Caro, short for Caroline. Dr. Andrea Douglas and I, Delaine Smith. Jeffrey Hammond, Professor Emeritus. I am Phyllis Leffler. There was a real philosophy at the university, a real philosophy of white supremacy. There are just people who like tell this history as if it's way in the past and don't see how it's affecting things today. John Smith, he wrote a summary of Virginia Indians. He said, oh, the Monicans, they don't know how to plant. They won't give you food. They're a warlike people. They, they speak a language no one can understand. It's all nonsense. What are you trying to get people to realize? I guess that history is more complicated than we can ever understand, but we have to try. All right. So maybe we can have the trailer. I don't know if we can have a trailer, the trailer running in mute while we talk a bit about that. So, so tell us a little bit, a bit more about your process and what your goals were with uh, with Palimpsest. Sure. Uh, so, I actually started thesis um, making a game with a pick lock team, um, who I believe will be on later. Um, and we were making a game about infinite libraries, and that didn't end up panning out. And so, at the beginning of this semester, I started over, and I thought, okay, now I can try something that just I want to do that I've been thinking about for a while. And um, I was a counter protester at the rally in 2017. And I'd been thinking about ways that I could try to create a game that documented those experiences of counter protesting so that people could walk around and hear like, first person testimony about what it was like to do that. Um, but the more that I talked to people and especially activists from Charlottesville, the more I realized that that potentially could have been trauma porn um, and that I, I could have been asking people, especially those from marginalized communities to like really put themselves out there um, and, and talk about some of the most traumatic moments of their lives when they'd already done that a lot. Um, so some activists recommended that I focus more on the centuries of white supremacy that led up to the rally um, and allowed for the rally to happen in the, the first place and that that would be genuinely helpful and educational. Um, and so what I ended up doing over the course of the semester was interviewing experts, um, local historians and professors at the University of Virginia about the histories of these marginalized communities. So for what you've done, this is another journalism piece and you also write you know, you're a, you're a journalist yourself and have, have published, you know, several uh, pieces of uh, investigation journalism. So, so how was this different from, you know, the work that you've done, you know, for, for the uh, other outlets that you've written for? How is this different from, from the other kind of reports that you do? Um, it was totally different, actually. Um, 
some of the things like the only thing that remained the same was kind of interviewing people um like trying to just be the voice that asks the questions and then give space to the interviewee to say whatever they want um but when you're writing a, a piece of journalism and especially investigative journalism you usually um don't allow like there's not much feedback from the people that you are interviewing you want to make sure that you're writing as unbiased a, a story as you can but i felt like for this project it was very important that i get a ton of feedback from the people that i was talking to um and make sure like this is a, a biased game that is um it is subjective it represents the the experiences um and like the viewpoint of all the people that i talked to um and so it um it's not necessarily investigative journalism in in that sense like before i release this game i'm gonna make sure that everyone that i've interviewed is like okay with the way that all of their words are being used you know Marie, do you have any questions, comments? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm curious about, I, I feel like we're in a time right now, a, a time of movement where a, a lot of people are starting to look to their histories in, in a way of like thinking about ownership, thinking about um, the ways that we own the violence in our, in our shared histories. And I'm wondering, having gone through this process, if you have any feedback for people who are interested in doing similar work, um, and looking back and 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 owning some of the the harder things that have happened. Yeah, um, I think my first piece of feedback is just that I do think that games can be a really good tool for this because they make the history interactive um, and they allow you to place events in context. Um, and the second piece of advice I have, which is most important, is that if you're a white person, you should just be quiet and listen um, and like make sure that you are paying attention to what people tell you um, so that you are elevating their words and not using them for your own purpose. Right, so we've run out of time, but it's been such a treat. Congratulations, Elizabeth, on making such an amazing and important game for all of us. And I'll thank you for, for this amazing game. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yes, this has been really great. Uh, and we're going to go into the, our next game, is the Fascination, which is a bit of a riddle for all of you. I think Marie helped that a bit, at least in this early stages. Uh, so let's see what the Fascination is in a couple of seconds. Right, so we're back. We're going to talk about The Fascination by Caroline Porter, uh, who worked with their sister, Olivia, uh, in part of that. So, Caroline, would you like to introduce the trailer for your game? Sure. Um, so The Fascination is a digital sculpture game in miniature that engages with our perception of control and belonging in a witness narrative. Right, so let's watch the trailer. The universe is too large for us. Death is too large for us. Death hums in every stone. The great walls soar, the windows are too high. But suddenly, the walls descend. The windows are little spaces we kneel to peer through. The solar system contracts to an orrery. I am under the spell of the miniature. Galaxies and supernovas turn at the end of my kaleidoscope. I gratify my secret desire. I become a giant. I draw out Leviathan with a hook. I play with him as a bird. I stretch out the north over the empty place and hang the earth upon nothing. I've compassed the water with bounds until the day and night come to an end.
that's amazing. Uh, I know that because this is an actual sculpture and this is physical, it's something that is kind of hard to get across on, on the stream. So I know that you have some slides of the yes. kind of like, no, took over and explain it more of you know, what, what drives this since we kind of really touch it, which is the part, part of the, the important part of, of your piece. So so tell us a bit more with your slides. We might, you know, ask you questions in between. Yeah, sure. So each of these slides, it's just a little photograph um, still, because I, I know it's kind of hard to take everything in when it, in this video and it's totally not the way <laughs> I intended to show it, but here we are. Um, yeah, so we can go through to the next slide. Um, that this that was the first casino room, and then there we I call affectionately the parking lot. Um, then we have the tunnel of love, um, and then lastly the farm. And then that's um, so all four of those together are stacked up on top of each other in this um, sculpture of, of a building. And and you look through the windows, and that that activates. Um, a uh, motion sensor, which starts the performance in the term. Wait, you have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I saw this object as it was shaping. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm so sad that I can't uh, come and see it and touch it now. Do you? Uh, I have so many questions. I could watch that trailer 10 times. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't even know where to start, honestly. Like, I'm so struck by, I feel like your your visuals and your sounds like evoke a lot of sensory crossover for me. It's very evocative. It's very rich. Um, I, I want to know more about this witness narrative. I do always feel like I am observing um, from somewhere far away, uh, which is very mm -hmm. strange since it's really uh, pulling at me at all my feelings. Yeah, mm -hmm. tell me more about what it means to be a witness. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I started this piece with the concept of um, dollhouses and voyeurism. These two ideas that I felt went perfectly together. I saw um, uh, uh, museum pieces on dollhouses and I kept every time I peered into one, I, I felt like I was both like inside the dollhouse, imagining myself within it, but not really being a part of that, being too old to play with dollhouses, um, being much too big. And so I, I kept stirring around with this idea and then I came across um, the essay, The Fascination of the Miniature by Stephen Milhauser. And he really solidifies those thoughts to me, um, which is what I read in the beginning of the trailer, uh, that this idea of, of voyeurism that is just perfect for the dollhouse. Um, there are so many like places where we don't belong, but we love to look in. And I, I, I wanted to capture that feeling. And I think, especially now it's totally poignant. I mean, we can't meet up with people, but we walk down the streets and look in windows and, and imagine how everyone else's quarantine is. And, and I think this piece kind of is trying to capture what that feeling is and, and, and maybe imagine a more surreal and magical place that we might look into. Uh, and yeah. I, I don't want to take all the time, but really quickly, are these real places? Like, are these memories that I am looking at? Uh, are they collages? What, what is, kind is of, so strong? Um, they're kind of uh, a mix of things. So I, um, I started, when I started designing these rooms, I had to keep coming back to this thing, which is I can't stop dreaming about cruise ships at night. Mm -hmm. Almost every night I dream I'm in a cruise ship and those spaces that are so surreal, they're jam packed with all this kitschy themed, you know, spaces and, and they're too big. They're like a city, but they're also filled with so much small stuff. And so all of these spaces kind of came together through dreams of mine and, and memories of spaces that I have been in and that have felt magical. This is amazing. I think this is another example of a game that has become something different and, you know, without changing circumstances now it's even more touching not that it wasn't before but but <laughs> right there so it's been really wonderful uh we've run out of time but i just wanted to say congratulations this is really great job you know it's, it's really fantastic and yes as i think as maria was saying i can just watch your trailer forever, <laughs> and i hope you can actually see the real thing uh one day yeah. not so far away from us so thank you so much caroline thank you thank you, thank yeah. you both uh, and next, 
Uh, we're going to see the last uh, game of this uh, segment, Picklock, by Colonel Carson and Manager Jebsku. Uh, and I think that Marie had also um, a bit worked with them a bit, probably at the beginning. Yes, you were still around. I can't take credit. I take credit for nothing, but I definitely play tested and looked at things. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. So we'll be back in a second um, with Pick Rock. All right, so we're back with Picklock and we have Connor Carson and Mary, Mary Giorgescu who are going to uh, show us off another game that is physical, you know, that, that you need to really be there to play it. Um, but we'll do our best to, to get across how awesome this is. So uh, would you like to introduce your trailer before we start it? Yeah, uh, so uh, Picklock originally started as a smaller mini game within a much larger narrative game. And uh, as we sort of um, uh, fell into smaller groups, as we realized the project that we were making was maybe just too large to make in a year, we really realized that Picklock had uh, it really had some legs to stand on. We had a lot of really good feedback on it. And so we uh, attempted to make a game in a controller that was as, as closely related as possible to the actual physical experience of picking a lock. All right, so let's watch the trailer. Yay. Oh. These picks will work. And just very carefully. Oh. Uh. All right. Fine, precise movements. Mm. Nice. Yay. Yay. All right. So I believe we have uh, some of the gameplay footage kind of demoing yes. how the controller works. So would you like to tell us a bit more like how, how this works, how the game works? Sure. Um, so I guess I can talk a little bit about the controller and what's uh, going on here. Um, so it's a physical controller that we built specifically for this game. And the controller has a pick that goes up and down and a wrench that goes sideways. And that controls um, the overall puzzle. And the pick goes, uh, basically moves the, the little pin that you see. Um, Connor, you have anything to add on there? Yeah, so the idea uh, essentially was just that we were trying to, again, uh, bridge the gap between the actual physical experience of lock picking and the way we could represent that in a controller. And so um, for anybody not familiar with lock picking, you typically have two tools. You have that attention wrench, as Mary said, and that's going to sort of uh, place a certain amount of tension on the pins that allows you to move them up and then they stay in place as you move them due to that tension and then it will actually rotate the lock when it unlocks and then the pick itself is used to to move those pins up and down into the right alignment so that it can unlock and so while uh, as you can see the puzzle is not is not so much uh, directly related to the way the inner workings of a lock uh, actually is. The idea was that these really precise, almost surgical-like movements for the pick and the wrench would really closely resemble the physical interaction of moving those tools within an actual locking mechanism. Cool. Uh, Marie, you have any questions, comments? Yeah, thanks for making this. It yeah. really reminds me of, 
my teenage years I did pick a few locks I'm going to admit yes <laughs> um, um I have questions uh what kind of questions would you like because I have questions about locks um and I have questions about physical controllers right now um yeah what kind of question would you like uh <laughs> Those both sound great. Why do, uh, do you want to start with one about physical controllers? Yeah. yeah. So uh, tell me, okay, so this is incredible. I love, I love alt controllers. How can you allow the good people who are watching this to play this? Will you ship it from person to person? Like, can we, can we start like a journey for this lock picking? Journey? First to you, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we were both initially imagining this actually being, um, a game that you would experience in an arcade setting, um, but through prototyping and through actually doing some interviews with folks, we found out that most likely um, the place where this is best suited might be an escape the room. Um, so we have a few different options. Uh, we could still work on it being um, in an arcade setting the way that we had originally intended, or we could go the route of maybe building it out so that it can work um, as a standalone game that people can play um, as part of an escape the room. Um, so there are, I think, a couple of different things there. Yeah, those would be wonderful. I, I also need to know about the locks thing. So yeah. um, so tell me about your relationship to, to locks and lock picking. I wanna hear about like the inner workings <laughs> of your hearts when it comes to locks and things that are locked. <laughs> So initially, at least um, me personally, I didn't have a lot of experience with it, but when we were working on it in the context of the narrative game, we were trying to think how we could make a controller that would, that would get players more interested in the narrative, more immersed in the narrative, and, and this was sort of the initial idea. And then um, we started to do research out of that, and I got a little too into it, bought myself a pick lock set and some practice locks, and now I have a problem as a result of the <laughs> game. <laughs> But I love it. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I love that the game turned around onto you. And you yeah. Know, yeah. <laughs> and Mary, yeah, like what about you? Like a heavy, I have like a heavy hobby. It's like, you know, like <laughs> once you get into it, it's like, you're really into yeah. it. Yeah. 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 I think for me, I love exploring the um, relationships that we have with alt controllers and this project, the more and more we worked on it, the more and more we were honing in on a physical experience that was uh, giving us the emotional reaction, the same emotional reaction as though like you were um, at the point of picking a real lock. So I think this game actually is much more accessible than actually picking a lock. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of gives everyone that ability to experience that high of like success without necessarily needing to struggle with the actual way of, of picking a lock. Um, so we sort of were looking for an approximation using abstraction, and I think we came pretty, pretty close. Um, locks to me, though, locks um, came from the character that we were working on, and I think I just fell in love with this image of a, of a um, character who, uh, based on our previous stories, was very independent and just kind of um, very self-reliant. So that's that's where locks sort of fit in with my with my heart. I love this circular, by the way. Like it really, it, it's more like how a lock picking feels than it is in some ways in this way. Like that's how it feels. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing with this is is kind of like the guitar hero of lock picking. Like you feel <laughs> like you're actually picking the lock, but this is not quite what it is, but it feels like it, and that's the, the goal of it. Um, so yes. Uh, I think it was the, the end of our little segment, but uh, thank you so much, uh, Mary and Connor, for your game. Congratulations. This has been fantastic. Thank we you. Hope that we can play your game in the flesh. Yes. The lock. yes. 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 Thank you both. Bye. All right. Thank really you. nice to see you. All right. And um, it's also the end of the segment, and I have to say goodbye mm -hmm. to Marie. Thank you no. so much for joining us. It's such a Pleasure to have you around and I brought this talk in case uh, in case you had any special guests um, <laughs> <laughs> with children. You know, it was really nice to see you. Uh, yes. Yeah, and I feel like we match actually. I didn't know this was something. Uh, really yeah, well, kind of like matching colors, yes. I mean I had more <laughs> colors so it's a bit easier, but yes. Yes, um, we really great seeing you and having you around to close off the show. 
Uh, and also, you know, I have to say goodbye. You know, it's been a pleasure. You know, I'm really excited to have shown you this this games that that do real really mean uh, something to us. You know, again, you know, check them out, follow them. Uh, if you have the chance, I hope that that they'll find a place in your hearts. And please stay tuned for the last segment of the day, which is a showcase of local multiplayer games uh, hosted by my colleague, Charles Black. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I hope to see you in streaming soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. but Hi everyone, I'm Eve Korhonen, narrative designer at Housemark. This one here. Uh, sending you big congratulations all the way from Helsinki, Finland. Super proud of you managing to make it all this way and congratulate even when the last few months have probably been very difficult. But I hope you go out now and make games that in the future make us feel better and do better. So keep up the good work. Hey everybody, uh, here we are in the last segment of the uh, MFA portion of the NYU Game Center Showcase. My name is Charles Pratt uh, and I'm happy to be talking about this, uh, this last uh, tranche of games. But I have a special guest I want to introduce first, uh, Tim Rogers. Tim, you want to you wanna say hello? Uh, hello, how's everybody doing? Um, for people who don't know who Tim is, um, he's a game designer. Uh, I think one of the best writers about uh, games and game design of his generation. And just recently made the switch over to streamer video essayist, right, Tim? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's part of it. Yeah. And I, you have a I, dog. You're, you we want to yeah, this the is, dog. Yeah, this is my child. He's gonna he's gonna spectate with me today. All right, excellent. Um, so why don't we jump uh, right into our first game, which is going to be the bog.
All right, we are here with uh, Chapin, Siddharth, and Virginia, and they're going to show us the bog. Uh, you all want to introduce us to the project? Yeah, uh, the bog is a two versus two action arcade game about uh, alien bugs fighting for control of a swamp. Awesome. All right, let's roll the trailer. Cool. Um, so this is a four-player local multiplayer game um, featuring bugs. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the development process or maybe even go into a little bit about how the kind of structure of the game uh, works? Uh, there are the two teams. Uh, there's a kind of like capture the flag mechanic. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So uh, development on the game, I think, really started with uh, an idea about making something really kinetic and physical. Uh, we kind of knew from the jump we wanted to make something in the alt control space uh, or, or the arcade space. Uh, and we wanted a game that sort of uh, demanded a little bit more physicality from its players than something you'd find on like a standard gamepad or a standard arcade controller. Um, and that, that kind of led to the development of the control scheme. As for the, the structure of the game, I mean, obviously we were inspired by Killer Queen. Uh, uh, that's that's a big point of inspiration at the game. I think center. that's the reason I'm here, actually. It's got yeah, the, probably. It's got the bugs in it as well. I've it does. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so the the structure of the game is basically you you have lives, which uh, of course when you die you'll respawn and and spend one of these lives. Uh, but you can also go to your opponent's uh, nest where their eggs are and swipe one of the eggs and drop it in a whirlpool on a level, which will destroy one of the lives as well. So this is kind of uh, mobility focus, this back and forth of you're, you're kind of playing capture the flag and eliminating enemies and, and just trying to outmaneuver each other. Very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, you want to talk a little bit about the art style, actually? Because it's also got a kind of very unique. I think when I first saw this, I described it as like a game that would appear in the Lawnmower Man or like Johnny <laughs> Mnemonic. It's got a very kind of like flat 90s 3D feel that's really, really cool. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about how that came about? Sure. Um, the inspiration for Bugs, it had started out as a very standard sort of mix type thing. And then um, just, I guess, I don't know, I made this uh, concept art for Bugs um, instead of mechs, just because Bugs are very mechanical. Um, and then it just sort of spiraled and developed from there. Uh, we wanted something where like, where you could really feel, I mean, with the alternate controllers, we want something where you could feel like you were actually piloting something. Um, and so a a bug felt more organic, I guess. Hmm. Cool. I think Virginia's early concept designs were really like inspiring to us. They had like really, really cool feel to them that made us like, oh yeah, we should go with this. Oh, thanks. Uh, Tim, you're uh, an expert at local multiplayer. Do you uh, do you want to uh, <laughs> do you want to comment? Uh, what do you, what did you think of uh, the bog? Just seeing the seeing the trailer and talking about it. Okay, so. Um... I'm. I'm not okay. I'm. Not, I'm not a hundred percent sure what is going on. Uh, <laughs> so, it's uh, this is four players. It's it's split screen. Yeah. Is it? It's a split screen game. Okay. See, I couldn't tell if it was split screen or this was a stylistic. Uh, 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 it was originally intended to be an arcade game. Well, we uh -huh. had arcade cabinets set up. That was the original intent. Uh, oh. Split screen sort of came about after we were uh, confined to isolation. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, we have a prototype for one of the the controllers here. Oh, I see the control. It's like a twin stick. It's like yeah. a What were the uh so what what was the thinking behind the controller? So I've I've played a lot of these twin stick. You know what one of my favorite competitive games that I remember that I always wished would have been it which should have been esports. You ever uh Charles Pratt, do you know uh do you know Cyber Sled? Oh yeah, I remember oh, yeah. Cyber Sled. Yeah. Cyber Sled this is This has good. a very uh, Cyber Sled aesthetic almost like it, Cyber Sled by way of uh, Killer Queen. And it's even got the two sticks 
thing yeah. going on. So I didn't, now that I can see the controller, uh, I, I'm not going to say that I'm not interested in the idea of a, of a simple four player two on two game. Cause that's one of my favorite things. But now that I see the controller as a fan of virtual on and, uh, yeah, virtual on virtual on i'm sorry as a fan of virtual on uh, especially oratorio tangram uh and uh cyber sled seeing that controller just makes me think yeah i wish uh i wish i wish there were big old arcades and a whole bunch of games like this nice. yeah i mean and th those games were definitely a, a big source of the inspiration right where uh it, it's a it's an old school control scheme but it's also one that um has been used a lot for for especially a game like virtual on which is very kind of stiff and mechanical and 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 in that way we really wanted to explore oh, could you use this control scheme to make something more fluid more organic so what is um, the uh what is what is the operation method here is it sort of tankish like cyber sled or yeah like, like you yeah move? very similar each stick controls kind of a side of the bug so if you want to okay i don't know how zoom is going to interpret <laughs> this but if you want to go you want to turn right you push the left stick forward and that'll okay. kind of add force onto your left side, arc you around to the right. If you want to do a faster turn, you can push the sticks in opposite directions, you know, go forward, you push both sticks forward. How much, kind of how much do you slide around when you, when you turn while moving forward? Do you slide a lot? Cause I like sliding. Yeah. You're pretty slippy. That was, that was a big focus yeah. we wanted was that the characters would actually be really fast and fluid and physicsy. Uh, so even when you kind of let go of the stick, you're going to have a little bit of drift afterwards. Uh, so, so it's about controlling that momentum. So nice. what is what so, is the yeah, flow ahead, of a match ahead, like? I'm oh, sorry, sorry. What's, no, what's no, the, that's all right. What what's the like flow of a match? How does how does it go generally? Generally, there's a, a kind of a big scrum in the middle, right at the start. Uh, mm -hmm. You you kind of have a straight shot over to the nests. Uh, and then you have to kind of bank off to the side to get to the whirlpool. So players generally kind of meet up in the middle and start fighting. Uh, and once you are either able to kind of slip past your opponent's line, maybe have your ally distract them or get away from them, or not able to do that, that's going to kind of determine what happens next. If you're able to kind of slink through, stealing eggs starts to become a really valuable strategy. If you're if you're kind of stuck in the middle, then uh, that's where fighting. Uh, that you generally you'll kind of play out the rest of the game just fighting each other. Cool. What's uh, what's next for y'all? <laughs> Survive well, lockdown. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think this next for all of us? I suppose it, it's <laughs> the unfortunate reality of this game. I think that uh, uh you know, we we picked a, a rough time to to do an alt control game, but uh, yeah, next steps I think are really going to be determined by when it becomes feasible and viable to to work on something like this in person again. Uh, yeah. You know, when we will actually be able to kind of build the physical component of the game and and get that uh aspect lockdown i think being able to like have our game at wonder Bowl or something when that's a thing that's possible or run a tournament that would be that would be a lot of fun for us that'd be something that we'd love to do to have people play uh the game as it was meant to be experienced with the controllers as opposed to right now with controllers at home what is what is the physical space uh setup like like are how are the screens oriented how are, are there seats or do you stand or like what what's up with that Definitely, definitely standing. That was the thing we talked a lot about. We had a foot pedal in our design at some point. Oh so, man, you should have kept. I'm sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to hate, but you should have kept the foot pedal. You shouldn't. <laughs> I, I think. Uh, I think a foot pedal and handles is like it's hilarious to me. Well, maybe we're, uh, a lot of controversy about the foot pedal. <laughs> well, all right, we're gonna we're gonna have to move on to the next game. But uh, this oh. this was a uh, great. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to getting a chance to play this uh, as soon as possible. So great, great job, everyone. Thanks so much. Y'all play that. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Tom. Cool. All right. Up next, uh, the game we're going to be looking at is uh, Burfia. Uh, so stay tuned.
All right. Uh, our next game is Burfia with uh, Tammy, uh, Suyi, Chang, Yurin, Danan, and Jin. Thanks for coming in. Do y'all want to introduce the game for us? Uh, yeah. Nice to meet y'all. Uh, this is Burfia, uh, a chaotic couch action game of Wobbly Birdie set in the comic world of New York City. Awesome. Great. Let's roll the trailer. <laughs> Great job. All right. Perfect. Um, very cool. That was perfect. So uh, the, the question I'd love to start with is uh, you have a great uh, art style. Uh, you have a kind of mix of cell shading and, and kind of comic books. You have like kind of like big words that appear as uh, as almost like particle effects in their own. Could you talk a little bit about how you settled on that art, art style? Uh, yeah. So um, in the very beginning, we were using some like our asset from the Unity store and we were created like a style, stylized kind of art style. Well, it looked nice, but it's not like very unique. And uh, we have a very talented art team. So um, so we are just like researching on like what kind of art style is missing like in this type of game. And, um, and I believe that was the time that uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse just got into the um, got into the market and we were just uh, we loved that kind of art, art style and and decided to like implement it in, into our game. Very cool. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about the influences on this game? We were actually talking about the last game kind of early arcade influences. Uh, what were you looking at as you were developing uh, Burfia? What were you what games were you taking your cues from? Um I think the first game that we reference is Human Fall Flat because mm -hmm. this game is developed during mm -hmm. the um, Studio One in Bennett class where he had a Simon Ford physics game. So we were researching about like uh, the wobbly kind of movement of the characters. Uh, but then um, because it's becoming a like faster pace and a more exciting uh, action game. So uh, we kind of like um, move it away from the the really physics controlling um, that, that kind of game, and then like reference more about like uh, Overcook, some chaotic couch um, action game like Stick Fight. We also play a lot of um, Bushido Blade. We reference the one hit kill, that kind of part, like adding uh, more um, well, like exciting atmosphere into our game. Yeah, this is, uh, so uh, for people who have been watching the whole showcase, this is the second time Bushido Blade comes up. One thing you might not know if you've never been to the Game Center is that we make all of our students play Bushido Blade. Literally, it's one of the first things you do in class. In your oh, that's first class. wild. Uh, Bushido Blade is a game that up until a couple years ago, I had not met anyone who had played it, except myself. Everyone I talked to is like, oh, I've seen that game, I've heard of that game. And I've, I've even, I'm not gonna name names, but I've even met some people who have made games influenced by Bushido Blade with their only uh, actual experience with Bushido Blade was watching 30 FPS YouTube videos of it. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're making people play Bushido Blade. That's a congratulations and thank you. I like Bushido uh, Blade. What about Power Stone? Is there any Power Stone in this? Did you guys play Power Stone? No. Oh, Power Stone's cool. 
That's all I have to say about that. So Tim, uh, once again, we have a uh, local multiplayer and you're an expert uh, in the field. I mean, what was, uh, what are your impressions of the game? So this is another local multiplayer game with, you have multiple, uh, multiple win conditions. Is that right? You, um, you kill, you uh, kill to get points or you, well, there's multiple ways to earn points. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So making the delivery gets you three points. Making a kill gets one point, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. That's good and clean. I like it. It's nice and clean. And it seems simple. So what's what's the deal with this one hit kill? What is the uh, it says it, the trailer said risky one hit kills. Oh yeah, what's, could you talk? There's a there's like an attacking defending dynamic, right? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So every action in our game has uh, has multiple effects. Uh, one of the <clears throat> one of the most important effect is that it's not it's really powerful. So that once it's successfully executed. You almost you can almost one shot anybody, but the side but uh, every action also had a have a side effect. Um, that um, for for instance, this melee punch you are seeing, um, you can dash dash forward, and uh, every action also has a um, what should I say has a a blockable component to it, so you can counter every attack. Uh, even even the weapons. So most of the weapons you can counter it by pressing B, and um, melee attacks can be countered by pressing B. Everything can be countered by pressing blocks. So that's how we create a very dynamic and uh, like a really uh, dra dramatic gameplay in the. Excellent. The the game seems so developed already. Are are there kind of like ways you're thinking of expanding it? Um... Uh, new levels, characters. I mean, I, this is kind of you know a fighting game. Uh, what are what are your thoughts as far as next steps for the project? Uh, so we're we're thinking of like developing more like modes of the game. So right now, this mode is depending on like um, who's who gets to uh, forty first. Um, but like in other modes, we have like different winning objectives. So that would be a totally different. Uh, play experience for the player um, and we are also considering like adding more character to make them more like differentiable and um, and also um, in different city too we're considering maybe um, in Tokyo or maybe in um, in Guangzhou <laughs> we haven't like really thought about that yet um, we're currently looking for a publisher who's willing to fund uh, fund us <laughs> If you're gonna do Tokyo, you've got to have a team of crows, because the the crows in Tokyo are huge and scary. You should have crows uh, in there. Also, can I just say I really, really like the name. Uh, the name uh, for some reason when I first saw the name on the title screen, I, I, I don't know. I felt very excited by the name. How did you come up with this name? It's great. It's it's very classic sounding, and it's funny. Like who who came up with the name? Uh, we each just pick a character of our favorite and and just name it. Yeah. Um, Burfia. So... It sounds good. Oh, you you mean the title of the game? Yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> so in our uh, very early version, uh, the winning objective is to deliver a bomb to bomb the opponent's like base, and if Phil very mafia like and because our character is uh, bird and it's burfia burfia okay i like and it and then um we kept the name because it just sounds funny in a way yeah and we also like thinking about like making burfia the like the death effect sound of the character diane charlotte burfia <laughs> it's good it's a it's a good it's a good weird name it's great that's uh, uh, that's awesome. Simple uh, and weird. That's what I like. That's that's the secret to a good game. Uh, all right, thank you all uh, for for uh, for showing the game. Uh, again, I'm I'm really looking forward to playing it. Uh, the next stage. It seems like it's just going to get bigger and better. So, thanks yeah, everyone thank for you. coming in. Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Uh, thank all you right, up us. next we are going to take a look at uh, Zenith Junction.
All right, here we are with uh, Zenith Junction. Uh, Y'all want to introduce the trailer for us? Sure. Uh, so what you're about to see is Zenith Junction, a digital deck building RPG where players use tiny sets of cards to defeat massive foes. All right, let's go to the video. Very cool. Um, so this game is based around uh, a magic variant, right? It's inspired by the Pygao pa pa variant. Yeah. Is that yeah, right? So Do you want to talk a, a little bit about that? Yeah. So Pygao magic is a, basically it's a, a variant of magic where you crack open a pack of booster cards and you break it up into like five sets of three. And then you have to play these like mini games of magic. Um, and so I was playing a lot of that and I was like, you know, this would be a cool game like on its own, like that was just made just for this. Um, and, uh, so I had a paper prototype and I was testing it out over the summer. Uh, and then I was like, you know, what would also be cool is if this was digital instead. So, uh, then became the lengthy transition from anal from tabletop to digital and, um, mixed in some deck building, some like SRPG, like positional mechanics. And, uh, and now we have Zenith Junction. Oh, awesome. And trains. <laughs> yeah, where, where do the trains come from? So tell me where the trains come from. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so the, the, the creative inspiration behind the trains is just like, um, I've always been really inspired for, by like that feeling you get when you see like either just a train like in the middle of nowhere, you know, like when you look at pictures of like the Trans-Siberian Railway or something, or like um, also like Broadway Junction in Brooklyn, where it's like you've got these cool like overlapping tracks. Mm. Um, and then I was like, that's cool just in isolation and then let's add like magic to it and that's the setting um and that like ended up turning into this cool sort of like occult lots of like magic sigils mm. everywhere like anime steampunk a uh, bit of like american labor history mixed into it too and uh yeah and so now we we have we have our our, our quirky setting <laughs> Very cool. Palmy, you were the artist, correct? You want to talk a little bit about where the world, the look of the world came from? Because it's really fascinating. There's a giant garlic that you fight. Is that a garlic? Is that an onion? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the garlic is actually like um, the land designer um, and we like keep it. Um, but yeah, so basically it a, I... Hmm? No, it was, it was a, we were using it for play testing and it just kind of got nicer textures and just became more and more uh, horrible. <laughs> yeah um but yeah so i'm i'm working mainly on like the ui stuff and the all the effect and interaction on the screen um and well yeah so like we, we kind of like wanted to like um so we bought we bought a fans of like you know anime cartoon stuff um so we kind of like lean want to lean onto that but it's like not too heavy so it kind of come out as something kind of uh kind of like semi-realistic um on a sense but like still keep all the fantasy stuff in there and uh yeah and like the, the idea of the ui is like we want it to be to make the player feel like i mean even though it's, it's a card game but like we want them to feel more like they are really like working on the engine like kind of in the in-game world um having the ui being kind of like pseudo diegetic um graphic design um and so yeah it's kind of come out like that <laughs> mm -hmm. cool uh, Tim, what are your what are your feelings about? Uh, are you are you a card game player? I only know this because I'm I'm loosely associated with uh, Magic: The Gathering. This this PyGal format. Uh, I've uh, I've I've, I've played a little bit of Magic: The Gathering myself. Uh, I like the uh, you know what I like I like uh, the Rochester Draft or whatever it's called. I love I, Rochester Draft. Yeah. I played that with somebody uh, that was a uh, that was believe it or not the first time I ever played Magic. Uh, I had never played Magic before, and my buddy from rochester said do you want to play 
this and i really liked that so i'm i i try to keep up on whatever i can with magic and uh this is interesting so okay you got tiny hands of cards how many yeah, hands yeah. how so many you, cards at a time so you get dealt nine um okay. and then you have like three engines and uh -huh. you, you make three sets of three um and the way sort of the way that you can kind of think of that is like imagine if you have you know your norm your you know three or four attacks in an rpg but you actually have to construct them you know before choosing which one to use right so you're making three attacks and then uh dueling those off against your your enemies subsequent three attacks so this is a, this is a multi is this a multiplayer game it's single player single player okay oh that's that's exciting um i mean it would be exciting if it was multiplayer if it was multiplayer you have a good name for a game for people to abbreviate for multiplayer so consider making multiplayer because then people would say that they play zj mm. right like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. i play zj like it, it sounds cool like someone would would feel cool saying they play zj yeah we actually have the opposite thing that most games do where you make the first letter of the game like an a so that it's the top of the list you want to be at the bottom we're at the bottom so. <laughs> you should have it be guy. two z's you should be zz enith yeah Z -Z beards so it's two right, z's ZZ top. Yeah. so then you're um, definitely at the bottom <laughs> all right uh well thank thank you guys the, it looks uh, it looks incredible uh and we'll uh, we'll be looking to play it uh soon right uh you're yeah. uh, is there a place we can play it right now um not at this moment tonight but we will have a demo coming out on uh the itch page uh but you can follow us on twitter at zenith junction for news updates demos playtesting, anything like that um but uh, cool. thank you guys and also i just want to shout out uh, our, our music was uh, in game was done by David Yuhiko, and our trailer music was by Ahimitsu on SoundCloud. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to Tim as well. Tim, thank you so much for mm -hmm. uh, for dropping in and helping us uh, talk about these. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, yeah, talking about these games. Um, do you want to talk about uh, where we can find your work and what you're up to these days? Well, um, uh, I've started a Patreon. Uh, it's doing okay. It's patreon.com slash action button. I used to have a website called actionbutton.net. Uh, and uh, people liked me when I had that website. <laughs> then I stopped updating that website. And seven, seven years passed. And I decided to start a Patreon so that I can bring it back. And I will be posting a video. It's videos now. It's, it's not text. If you want text, you have to pay. <laughs> The text is available only for people who back the Patreon. So um, the first video will be available next Monday. Videos are free. Text costs money. Uh, all right. Because I think that's funny. It's a good but, tagline. Yeah. yeah. Money. Uh, all right. Monday. <laughs> Thank next <you> Monday. Tim. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, okay. Uh, up next, we're going to be looking at. Um, uh, I it was Cara, Car Carrara. I was Carrara. All right. Uh, stay tuned. Right. Uh, actually, I have a surprise. Uh, we were going to talk a game, but we have uh, talk about a game. But we have another special guest, uh, Rebecca Saltzman from Finji Co. Um, Hi. A really <laughs> impressive, really cool uh, company. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what it does, uh, Rebecca? 
Yeah. Um, so my husband, Adam, and I run Finji, and we are an internal developer. So we make our own games, and then we also publish games. So we publish Night in the Woods. Um, we have Tunic and Chicory coming out. Um, we actually lost uh, Wilmot's Warehouse on iOS today. Um, so yeah, pretty awesome. Busy. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So we are going to look at uh, I Was Carrara uh, up next. Okay, we are here with uh, with uh, Shu Yi and uh, Gong Su, uh, and we are going to look at I Was Carrara. You all want to introduce the video for us? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so our game is called I Was Carrara. I Was Carrara is a fashion forward narrative game for mobile, and it's a game about influencer culture and self-realization. Yeah. Great. All right, let's get started. Oh, that was great. Um, so I would love to hear the story of how you hit on this theme. It seems really unique and fascinating. Um, how did you how did you decide to do a game about influencer culture? Uh, well, so first we started because we both of us love the paper doll game. Like you can dress your own character, but we kind of feel a little bit unsatisfied because nothing really happened after you dress up your character. So we want to make a game about what happens after dressing up. And so we started asking ourselves, like what exactly do clothes and our appearance represent? Like, um, can we really tell who a person is through what they wear and how do we do so? And to answer those questions, we kind of realized that we need to put our main character in a situation where she also faces the same problem in her life. And so this is where the influencer thing came in. Hmm. Interesting. So I saw this um, earlier this week, some of the materials, uh, both Adam and I did, uh, and we love it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've Thank actually you. been talking about it kind of since. Um, I am actually very, very curious. Um, we were actually talking about how this reminds us a lot of sort of Jenny Zhaoshao's work. Um, and we were super interested in kind of like, one, where your art styles come from, two, why is the boss a fish? Um, <laughs> Cause we love that. And like, um, how do you envision like the progression of the game going? Like, um, cause we were like, we could keep adding outfits to it. Like the sort of that we were talking about the business model of the game, just that's where our brain goes. So we're like super curious about like, 
um, how you wanted to take this, what you have now and um, kind of expand upon it. Uh, that's a lot of questions. I love this game, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so first, um, how to expand this game. I think because we're planning to have five chapters in the game. And uh, so you, so there is a um, app called Ice Cream, which is something like Instagram in the world in the game. And the users of Ice Cream, they're actually the customers of the laundromat. So we're planning to like, uh, through each chapters, there's new characters in the, uh, ice cream and you get to know them and their clothes and you know their stories and that is basically um like how we want to progress in the game and also uh yeah i guess there's one more question about the art style the art style is like so basically we were extremely inspired by um nintendo splatoon like we really like that art style and feeling of the characters and we want to have the, uh, like the fluorescent colors in a game. Awesome. Interesting, you, you, talk about, um, you talk about being inspired by Splatoon, but it feels like there's like a really a wonderful little crop of um, narrative phone games. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe inspirations that you were drawing from for this type of format, right? For the idea of a, of a narratively focused, richly kind of illustrative um, uh, phone uh, game. Did you talk about that? Uh, so I think it's a little bit hard to uh, say because I think we, from the beginning, we had a lot of elements we wanted to put in the game. And it, it just built up together. Like, um, so when we started designing the game, I think it's pretty hard to find references because all the game in the same category, they're like, they're like only the dressing up part. And uh, so we, I think we also referenced a lot from uh, Assemble with Care, like mm -hmm. the uh, feeling of like how that game tells story through uh, and also have a very complete game loop. Yeah, we've actually, um, we've been exploring something similar just like internally over here, where we've been looking at the way text-based systems are like a part of the story. So Adam was recently playing uh, like Eliza last night, um, possibly Control, um, and then a few others, but also we've been talking a lot about style savvy um and it feels like there's i don't know if you've played it but like a little bit of sort of the like the guts of style sevy where like everything like there's no punishment necessarily mm -hmm. just like it's just happy like you just get to sort of create new pieces um and the answer is really interesting thing to explore in games um just in general yeah, we actually came through the same problem like in the very beginning because you are wearing your customer's clothes and we thought that maybe there should be some kind of punishment if you do not return them in time. But we like in the end, we decided that there shouldn't be any punishment because it's a dressing up game and you can wear whatever you want. Uh, so we kind of cut it off from the game. Do you, um, uh, so you said that you're thinking about expanding it into new chapters and, and new stories. Do, do you have kind of a, a sense of when that might be? Are you, are you gonna try to like do all of that and then release it? Or are you gonna try to do it ep episodically? I guess what I'm asking is like, when can we play this? Cause it seems amazing. Um, yeah, we hope that we can get it on App Store or something as soon as possible, but it really needs a lot of art assets because you have so many kinds of codes in it. So uh, I guess we are kind of, maybe we would get a demo out there once we finish chapter two, because we already have a uh, story arc for the game. So maybe this is a little bit spoiler, but Kara is actually not the name of our main character. It's just somebody else in the game. And that is where the title comes from. Oh, very cool. All right. So on that cliffhanger, um, I want to thank you for joining us. This was great. This game looks so impressive and I'm so, uh, I'm so excited to eventually get to, to check it out. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, all right, up next is our final game of the evening, uh, which is Bird Town. Right. Uh, we are here with uh, Danny Hawk, who's going to show us uh, Birdtown. Danny, you want to you want to introduce the trailer for us? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Birdtown is just a comedy video game about a town of birds. All right. Great. Let's roll it. <laughs> All right, amazing. Um, actually, so you have a collaborator on this project, right? Uh, Michelle Bao, do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, what they contributed to the to the game? Yeah, totally. Michelle Bao is uh, one of my good friends and she did all of the bird illustrations in the game. So oh. every bird you see is all Michelle Bao's work. So please go follow her everywhere. <laughs> Awesome. Um, can you, so uh, I guess the question you probably always get is uh, why birds? What's what, what 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 attracted you to make a town <laughs> full of birds that you could wander around in? What's the so um, I originally started. I was just like, oh, birds are great foil for I don't know jokes, things, game. Uh, and then I went to like pigeons because I thought pigeons were very funny and specific. And then I just blossomed back out to birds and just like. I felt like there was a lot of fruit for just like the hopping and their their tiny brains and like their pertness. Um, so it feel, felt like there was a lot of opportunity for birds. Um, I'm actually super curious. Mm -hmm. um, I also saw this one yeah. uh, a little bit before this. Um, I'm curious about the art style. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's actually really fascinating. Um, and I like the way that the sort of various colors will like draw your eyes to various pieces of it, but I'm curious mm -hmm kind of what else you're going, like, are you gonna do anything else with that? Are you gonna change it? Um, or how did you sort of settle on uh, this mm -hmm. particular style? Yeah, I was, so I came into the thesis process with a uh, specific kind of visual style I was pulling from. Um, I was referencing uh, a couple of artists and then along with a film called Future Thoughts, which is all very white with a lot of accent mm -hmm. colors in it. And I really wanted to replicate that in a 3D game. Um, and so the plan moving forward to this is just as I populate the town even more and more, anything that's detailed will be colored, but anything that's like environment or just kind of more backgroundy will always just kind of be white with an outline. 
So is this going to be signaling like interaction or just what looks good? Yeah, um, we're actually, yeah, we were looking yeah. at um, like old mirror's edge and mm. um, which signals like the blue, yellow, and red um, in a conversation we we're having mm -hmm. earlier today. So I was curious when I was thinking about this at the same time, um, like, is there an interaction component to the color? I mean, anything that's interactable will be colored, but that's more like a square and rectangle kind of thing where just anything that is of interest will be colored in the world. If it's like just plain environment, it'll be white. Hmm. Nice. The structure of the game is circular, correct? Like you're meant to play kind of the, one of the things that maybe doesn't come across mm -hmm. in the trailer is that you're meant to play this like over and over again as like a 15 minute game. Yeah. And then you explore another part of the town. Do you want to talk about how you decided on that kind of a structure for the experience? Yeah, so it's really close to being like a, a time loop video game. Um, but the idea is that you just can play the entire game in a 15 minute real time sitting. Um, so you start and you'll have your experience because I wanted to, this game, I was really interested in the idea of like agency in a video game. Like what does a single player mean? How can you kind of feel like you're in a simulation or in a world doing what you want without necessarily just like the world being waiting for you to kind of interact with it in its preset way. So I decided like creating a, a, an event, like a 15 minute window into this main character's life uh, makes it so that you can kind of experience it however you want. There's loads of different storylines or there's a lot of different interactions or there's just like goofy things you can do or you can just like kick a soccer ball or be distracted or just like nap. Um, and just like the way that a, a person can play the game over and over again, but it's not a time loop. There's not one main storyline they're going for, um, but rather they're just kind of creating their own 15 minute stories in different ways, like kind of in, I don't know, like fractal in journals. That's really cool. cool. So how big is the, like, how big is it? Like how many times mm -hmm. can you envision somebody doing the same 15 minutes? Um, I'm right now I have just like 30 minutes or so in there, mm -hmm. but I'm shooting for it to it'd be, if you want to do everything, if you're like completionist, um, between three and four hours of different Very kinds cool. of loops. Yeah, and, and the idea is that there's like main story, there's also just a lot of like activities or, you know, like little small things you can do that you can just take up your time that aren't like narrative plot. We call them the squirrely bits. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like at Night in the Woods, you can just sort of like get stuck off in some weird side quest forever. Yeah, or like the casino in Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, there's also, um, you talked a little bit, or you have talked about kind of the intellectual um, place that this game is coming from with uh, the, the idea of meta-modernity. Um, do you want to mm -hmm. talk about um, how you're thinking about the kind of intellectual tradition, or the kind of very young intellectual tradition that you feel this game fits into? Yeah, so the pitch is very much just like, hey, it's a comedy video game. It's right. funny. I hope you laugh. I hope I'm funny. Um, but a lot of the like kind of underpinning of the game and really what I want to make with it and explore narratively is the idea of metamodernism, which is not metatextual, but rather kind of like really quickly going between happy and sad, highbrow, lowbrow, like uh, postmodern and modern um, in a way that is so rapid and is so of a note of like our current generation, kind of how we experience the internet and life now um, that like, while there's a lot of funniness in here, I wanted every character to be rooted in reality or like the current iteration of the game is all jokes, jokes, jokes until the end where it's just like, oh, you know, these are characters, they have like complex inter like relationships with each other. Um, so kind of putting those right next to each other in like really, really like little bits where you can hop by something and be like, oh, I realized something that's really sad um, is something I was really wanted to explore. Wow, amazing. Um, well, unfortunately that's all the time we have, but Danny, thank you. Uh, do you know what, what timeline are you looking for when uh, people can, can play this, maybe a demo or something? Yeah, so we're definitely trying to shoot for like an early 2021 completion. Um, all the systems are in now, so it's just about making the town and making the birds. So hopefully it'll be done by then. But you can follow our mailing list on birdtowngame.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for showing cool. it to us. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank our special guest, uh, Becca Saltzman. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you want to talk about what Finji uh, is up to and, and what we should be expecting from it in the next... Uh, uh, Six months to a year or something? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've always got uh, too many projects going on. Um, yeah, we've got Chicory and Tunic that are sort of the next two big releases that we're working towards right now. And then we're finishing up sort of Overland 1.2. Uh, 
Um, also like Night in the Woods iOS is still like in QA and everything. So, I mean, a lot. <laughs> we have a lot yeah. going on. <laughs> Uh, well, then thank you so much for finding time to, to be here with us and our students. We really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Cool. All right. Uh, and for everyone who's on the stream, uh, we are going to have a short message from Jennifer Hale, and then uh, we're going to come back for that and have a whole faculty with Frank saying a goodbye. Uh, so please stick around for that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Hello, game design students. It's Jennifer Hale here saying congratulations. Mm, we very, goodbye, very we well done. Very well wow. done. It's a uh, wild time we, to be graduating, isn't it? <laughs> um, I just right. want to say that also I look forward to working with many of you in the future. And uh, have an awesome, awesome day and an awesome time. And I will see you soon. And now I should go.
speak Try freely. Yeah, Try we can't hear you. I gotta speak freely. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It's coming. Are we good? You guys hear me? Right? Can you hear me? Yeah? Oh my God. Was I right or was I right? I was right, right? Are you kidding me with that show? Unbelievable. All right, let me hear from the chat. Who wants to see that every year? In addition to the show in person, the end of semester, end of year show. Also this, a chance to see every project, hear from every team, um, streaming, uh, conversations, dialogue, game design. All right, good. So we're going to do it. I'm going to promise right now. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do it. I'm sorry, but this is the curse of doing a good thing. These are the people that did it. Un the amount of work that went into the show was unbelievable. Last minute, classic Game Center. Every single person on the Game Center staff, in the Game Center faculty, all of so many students. Uh, I want to shout out to Robert Yang, the stream papa himself, the 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 heavy lifter, the guy who figured out how to just by hook or by crook get the Game Center onto Twitch in the first place. Um, but also Logan for the back half bringing us home. Um, I want to I want to shout out Jessica, Gwenna, Tony, Hermione, Dylan, and Kevin. Uh, the faculty, Naomi and Clara and uh, and the Matts, Matt P and Matt B, uh, Bennett, Charles, Winnie, Eric, Mitu, uh, the 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 students across the board, the show committee. Have I for, have did I forget anybody? Um, I love these people. Uh, they put in so much sweat and blood and tears. Uh, into making this thing work, and it worked so well. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's been a rough time for everybody. And to end it with this, are you kidding me? To end it with this is is almost more than 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 I can take. I seriously uh, am feeling a ton of emotion. So uh, thank you so much. The chat, thank you everybody for showing up. Um, Naomi's on fire. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 Yushin Zabo version of uh, the Game Center come to life, and um, and thank you everybody for for doing this. Uh, 2020 Mirabai, the typing when 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 Mirabai was translating Robert saying that Mirabai is translating me. That was maybe the best thing that's ever happened. That was so good. <laughs> Um, thanks everybody. Game Center for life. Congratulations to all of the students. You're the best. You did it. Everybody turn their mics on. I, I don't want to, I'm tired of talking. Somebody else talk. You get Tim Rogers out here. Can Tim Rogers say a few <laughs> words? Come on. Let's give him a chance to speak. <laughs> is that rim? Is that rim in the screen? Well, I feel bad for the people in the bottom row. They got all covered up by text. I can fix that one second. <laughs> oh, no, sure is not here. I'm yeah, gonna make Mirabai type her own name. Mirabai. 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 I'm chewing on, on, on the stream now, aren't I? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day, everybody, all right? It's just getting yeah. better and better. <laughs> all our, are we still Where's live? The after party at? Yeah, yes. I think we're a little punchy right yep. now is what it is. Are we still Where's live? Is there live? Yeah. Good night, everybody. Bye, uh, thanks to all the guests, just, by the way. Thanks to all the guests for the guests. Greg Heffernan. All the hosts fake think they're guests. Thank you, Greg. Oh, yeah, thank you, Jim and Robert. Why are you embarrassed, Robert? For the music, too. Why is Robert embarrassed? For Robert, no take, a, take a bow. Take a yeah, victory. Robert, let's no, just... yeah, I'm big bow for Robert. Yeah. I'm overcome with yes. emotion and um, sentiment and Me too. pride and such. Me too. And and we didn't the students? We should probably thank the students. Yep. Reach out all the students. Thank you, amazing student show committee. Unbelievable. For helping pull all this off. Coming through. 
Yeah. Frank didn't thank himself, so thanks, Frank. Thanks, oh, Frank. Thank yes. you. Thanks, Frank. Should we should we just move the uh, the camera to backstage now? Wait, what, what what happens if we close all the breakout rooms? Will it just blow oh, up? Yeah, let's close the breakout rooms. Let's see what happens. Oh, oh, okay, I'm oh, doing God. it. Uh -oh. Let's oh, see God. what happens. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> How many mats will we see? I'm that returning the main stage. It's going to crash on my computer. <laughs> we broke Twitter. Let's see if we can break Twitch. Yes. <clears throat> oh, we have a time, a time down. Cool down. OK. But oh well, it's all good. Oh wait, what happened? Logan has to come here. There we go. Oh, oh now it's a giant oh, thing. Oh. Logan Claire. Okay. Oh no, everybody's on the street. We're on it now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's freaking out a little. <laughs> <It's exciting. laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you're, you're in the room, turn up. your camera on. <laughs> Let's see if we can break it. We're gonna break it. We're gonna break it. Start paging through those pages. Um, are we st okay? One more time around. Mine already broke. I think that's what happens when I have <laughs> yeah, like one more two instances of oh, unity shit. plus plus thing. zoom running. McKenna, yeah, shout out to McKenna. Who's there? Yeah, unity open. Right now. <laughs> what are you doing? The first team, <laughs> am I right? The first team to appear on the stream and has been here ever since yeah. the whole time hanging out. That that is, uh, she's a stone trooper. That's what we call uh, a rock solid, dependable. <laughs> Puts you put the M and, and scram. Oh my God, Naomi. <laughs> Queen of scram. It's, like, it's like being in a place. I'm here to hold the fort. The scrampress. The right, scrampress. I'm gonna go to drink, everybody. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna talk now so that I can bump myself to the top of the screen. Let's see if this. Wow, Dylan. Wow. If anyone wants on screen, Dylan, just talk on, get up Dylan, there. The there are there are currently more people on screen than watching us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Really nosedived at the end here. We, we may have we may have crossed that Rubicon. <laughs> <laughs> There's no going back now. All right. <laughs> okay. uh, Congrats, everybody. Thank you, faculty, yeah, for putting this on. Uh, this was fun. All it's of like you. being in a place. Amazing. It I've been like, just. It's almost like being uh, in a place. It's like seeing <laughs> oh, people place, again. Tim. Are people looking at the Zoom or the Twitch? Because I'm looking at both. Just I'm looking at the Zoom. <laughs> I'm looking at the Zoom. We're gaining viewers now. I'm so delayed. That's can I show event. up at the Zoom? Where am I? Oh, I am on the Zoom. That's oh, no. Cool. Yeah, you're on the Zoom. Of course you're on the Zoom. <laughs> I'm at the Twitch. <laughs> the Zoom and the Twitch. <laughs> I'm going to go by. Bye. Bye, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Coming. I'll see you all. See you all later. Oh, I am on the suit. Oh no! Thank you, Robert. Oh, it's it's not leaving. It's not. It's like it, it, it froze. Application is not responding now. Hey, everybody, your number's am I still on? Just got kidnapped. <laughs> but Zoom's so true. Nice. We should do this it's all like time. Hotel California. You can't leave. <laughs> oh, welcome Bye. back, John. Read us your paper. John. Hey, what's up? How you doing? What? Read us your paper. No. Oh, hold on. I'm gonna get it. Oh, no. <laughs> Finally, you have a chance. <laughs> All right, everybody, sit down. Active <laughs> audience. Take an the history of the green star. John, fuck you. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, on that. McKenna, no. you are on live. <laughs> we are. We just got banned from Twitch, McKenna. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, McKenna. We just I've, got banned from Twitch. I've been here for. Six hours. I'll yeah, you earned it. Rid of that's on your own. That's nobody's like <laughs> telling you to be here. <laughs> you did this. <laughs> it was implied, though. <laughs> <laughs> my mom giving me a look through my the crevice in my door, like ashamed of me. <laughs> nice. That's Disappointed. About right. <laughs> All right, we don't really have an exit strategy at this point, do we? Yeah. Why do we have nope. so many more viewers now? We have like 200 oh. viewers. Don't know what happened there. <laughs> just get right there. There's one hang out. I think we're on the homepage of Twitch right now. Oh my there God. No way. Are we, are we just messing up our whole thing? Like now we become the show. Now we're just done. Well, let's start off <laughs> from the beginning. Right, Scram. Well, let's start over again. again. My, my green age. One more time. One more time. We can work out the kinks and make a much smoother 
uh, version of the show. We just did exactly. it oh my God, we are on the front page of Twitch. No, oh, no way. <laughs> no. Are you kidding me? I mean, Perfect timing. Twitch How many matches? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Where drunk people uh, make video games. Wait, so if you're, <laughs> if now we you're have just over it. the Twitch and you're not in the Zoom right now, but you're Game Center because everyone is Game Center for life, message us on the Slack and we'll send you the link. Oh. Yeah, and uh, don't be a stranger. What? Yeah, get a, if you're watching Twitch, you should be on Twitch. That's yes. how Twitch works. If you are Game Center alum and you're watching on Twitch, message one of us on Slack right now. We will invite you. <laughs> to Zoom. We're yeah. gonna put the, let's just put the link in the announcements. Just channel. put the oh, link yeah, in yeah, there. Yeah, that's true, that's true. We can let's get that the material. Uh, wait, 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 wait. wait. That guy. We had one <laughs> troll, his name was Materials. Champ oh or my something. God. Oh my God. Do he, was saying, he was saying some nasty stuff. Let's Wait, let's get that one. Come on, let's get our I one troll up, that in the, up in the let's Zoom. Get that. There was that one guy that kept posting his YouTube account. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said I look like a contestant from 90 Day Fiance. <gasps> you do, you look like Erica. I was thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so it wasn't like Don't song? be a bully. <laughs> <laughs> bullying I'm Erica cool. was the best part of that season. Oh, okay, I like it. So yeah, she's Australian. It's fine. She has cool hair. It's okay. Yeah, she's Australian. She was Thanks. a bit part. Her. We, yeah, we her need to do something to keep our viewers coming. No, no, I really, uh -huh. really, really should be wrapping up. So everyone be interesting. Yeah. We could, I could talk about the Beyonce. So there's Erica, and then there Hello? was her girlfriend. Uh, hey, Diego's here. Diego. <laughs> hey. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. ladies and gentlemen. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Isaiah, what's <laughs> up? Oh, Isaiah's here. Congrats, oh, everybody. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Isaiah. <laughs> All right, virtual backgrounds only, everybody. I don't virtual No, my laptop's too old. Best I can't use it. My laptop doesn't have that. Yeah, 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 no virtual backgrounds? No, nah, it like, it like uh, freaks out when I have. 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 I, of course, have to have the frame virtual Someone background. appreciates my background. background. Look, I'm in the worst yeah. TV show ever. <laughs> Isaiah, you're ready, ready for this next year, year, right? Huh? You're ready to do this next year, right? Oh, I'm so ready. I mean, that is if I don't take a gap year. Spoiler alert. Or the next year. <laughs> Great way to announce it. Isaiah, don't take a gap year. Come on. <laughs> I, I have no refunds, buddy. I'm a friend. 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 i am you can do it, buddy. <laughs> I believe in you. 62 people. Oh, the thing is, if uh -oh. I do take a gap year, gotta I just Jesse's here. Oh my god. It's kind of like a co-op year in a way. So. What's up, Kevin? What's up? Yeah, Yo, Parker, I see you over there. I'm talking my way to the top of the Twitch stream. Let's go. <laughs> Gotta jump into flash. Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> Everybody, if you're happy. Hi, Alex. Hey guys. There's Teague Alex. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice background demo. Don't put that nasty cryphophobia frog behind you. There's Teague Alex. Hello. Hi. Oh my god, there's so many people. Let's see Pukes up in the Zoom chat. Hello, Jesse Pukes. Look at Eric's. All right, change my background. Go, Jesse. Wait, wait, that's a great caption. The cat, the cat. Wait, no, it's Jesse Pukes. Ryan Clark. Bald? Jesse. No, Jesse Fuchs is a cat. Ryan Clark is the Canadian guy who. You know, Jesse shaved his head, or is that somebody else? Shaves his head and talks about. I love that so much. Many. <laughs> uh. I have a picture of the border of like the banner of Hey Pa. There's a goat on my roof, and I want to make it in my background so bad. Do it. <laughs> I'm gonna find a way. Do it. Life finds a way. Life finds a way. I just gotta go to Google Photos. It's not that hard. There you go. I think I'm be able to Emma made this in more somehow, right? I what happens if I don't do think this? I did. Oh, this is my oh, friend no. Ryan. Oh, oh, my God. God. oh no. No. Oh, stop it. Truth is going. Stop <laughs> it. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> MFing truth. That's my up initials. in this place. I know what that oh, means. It's happening. Starting with Charles. Give us oh, a ground truth, God. Charles. Away, Name Charles. one oh, yeah. ground truth. <laughs> one no. ground truth. Oh, my God. Charles, give us uh, one ground uh, truth. Start us off. Oh, wow. Well, I can't see this. Short-haired Frank. Short-haired Frank. Short Frank. Frank. Frank is terrifying. Beautiful. 
it's oh like wow. no it's not the same bring bring long hair frank back <laughs> <laughs> Frank is a completely yes. different person. Holy cow! <laughs> it ain't right. It Frank, I, gosh. I have an old video of you at oh, yeah, the must teaching and design right now. us. Yeah. It's insane. It's insane to see how different everybody is. Eric Are looks you like a different person me right now. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I'm line on you. Is what's oh. You're teaching the MDA framework. Yeah, I don't think you're going to be. My <laughs> Like, you have I swear to God, God. God. kept it together and we're this super professional much. for about six and a half <laughs> hours. <laughs> we tried, uh, you know. Still running. I had a window of Chrome open Actually, with almost all the student games. Did drink on stream, not on stream in Zoom, but well, you could do it off. You could <laughs> do it off. We, we did Thank it once. Let's much. do it twice. <laughs> yeah, everyone hydrate. You can't they smoke hydrated. on stream. Everyone drink water. Get in trouble. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think you get Drake on the stream. To right? keep that All right, Frank. I think it's in mind. Did we say get Drake on the stream? Who knows Drake? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Whoever the youngest is. Side. I'm drinking brown <laughs> at the bottom. Someone in this world has to have a way to get to Ninja. There's no way. There's no way. No. There's not at least one connection. <laughs> we get to Ninja. We get to Drake. It's that None simple. of the women can know Ninja. <laughs> Oh. Wall is up in this piece. Hello, Chris. Hey. Hey. Congrats, everybody. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> streaming, by the way. We have like 180 viewers. still streaming like, because we so said viewers. curse words. <laughs> I said bad things about NYU. It's just us. Uh, I think someone was naked call. briefly. I think Eric took his shirt off. <laughs> when the well, fire well, is well, done? Oh, there's no way we could still be on stream. <laughs> Is that true? There's rumors that during a game of Werewolf, you took your shirt off. Is that true? <laughs> We're about to. <laughs> I think we determined well, that was Kenna true. was telling us all kinds of stories backstage. Built right now. Are we gonna film Buster Twist until not they unban Robert's games? Yes, please. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Let's do it. Unban Robert Yang. <laughs> Hashtag free Yang. Yang. Legalize Yang. <laughs> Free Yang. Free Yang. Hashtag Free Yang. Free Yang. Free Yang. Free Yang. Go feature cat Logan. Yang Gang is already. She's begging. Gotta be Yang Gang too. Did people did people <laughs> notice Matt's dog yet? Because Matt's dog is very cute. Where's Matt's dog? Matt's dog. Tim's dog. dog was a dog. Dog is Baby Babis. That changed my life. Oh my God, Chris, your background. Oh my God. Okay, I'm closing this tab of Chrome. I can just... <laughs> yeah, let's you know let Logan, Logan go. go for the night. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to sign <laughs> off. The crying spell. Okay, we'll leave the Zoom. No problem, John? Who's back now? This is back. I'm proud of all of you. I love you all. <laughs> Goodbye. Just shut it down. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, on top. Congrats. Leave a warning or...